day before Thanksgiving in 1971, a man identifying himself as Dan Cooper bought a plane ticket from Portland to Seattle. He hijacked the plane, claiming he had a bomb in his briefcase and demanded $200,000 in four parachutes. He jumped out of the plane with the money and the bomb somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, never to be seen again. The FBI claims to have investigated over a thousand people, including dozens of deathbed confessions. In 2016, 45 years after the hijacking, the FBI suspended its investigation of the case. While the FBI is no longer looking for D.B. Cooper, there is a community of people who are trying to solve the case on their own. Welcome to the Cooper Vortex. In this episode, we're lucky to be joined by Patrick South. Patrick is a very successful entrepreneur, producer, broadcaster, and family man. His YouTube channels, The Adventure Agents, and The Axel Show have hundreds of millions of views. If those don't sound familiar to you, it's probably because these shows are designed for kids and families. Patrick has never claimed to be an authority on D.B. Cooper, Norjack, Skydiving, the FBI, and he's not even battling it out with the rest of us in the Vortex. I reached out to Patrick because his latest run of the Adventure Agents surrounds the D.B. Cooper mystery, and I was actually introduced to it by my 10-year-old daughter. If you listen to the show regularly, you'll know one of the questions I ask often is, why doesn't this case get the attention it deserves? This is where Patrick is doing some of the most valuable work on this case. He and his family are introducing the D.B. Cooper mystery to millions and millions of people. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Patrick South. All right, Patrick, when you're at a party and someone comes up to you and says, what do you do for a living? What mm -hmm. is your answer? I try to, with my family, help encourage and inspire other families to get out and adventure together. That's Wait, that is a great answer. Basic, that's like sort of fundamental, um, you know, and we can go deeper than that, you know, but I would say just collectively that's uh, uh, what we do. Our company is called The Familypreneurs, and the idea is entrepreneurship but with families. Um. And so, uh, and really it's not something that's new, you know, cause it, you know, the term family printer is something that, you know, you, you don't really find anywhere. We coined it, but we have since found other, a few other people who have mentioned it, you know, but if you look at humans historically, evolutionarily, you know, you can see that the family and even other creatures, there is a, um, a family premier aspect fundamentally to that. Right. And, uh, um, and so entrepreneurship is associated with taking risk families throughout history and prehistorically taking risk is what gets you, um, to a place <laughs> just where you can survive right and thrive <laughs> and so some of some of those families and individuals who took risk didn't make it <laughs> and very few did and we are the ancestors of those few uh family premiers that's the way i sort of see it because i see the family concept as something that's fundamental to um to life i suppose you could say on this planet um and I think it goes even deeper than that. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's um, that's what we do. And, you know, money comes from that, you know, somehow. <laughs> that's what I'm not exactly good at, you know, is figuring out exactly how to get the money to come from that. But um, yeah, so that first... is the challenge. Right, right. So when it first started out, it was just like, I, we didn't. You know, I worked my job, Sarah did her thing with Axel, and it's like, we. she wanted to be an entrepreneur. I 
wasn't really entrepreneurial, although I was very used to taking risks. Just I wasn't I, I had no concept of the financial world, you know, really. Um, and, and so you were working for a family company. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I was working for a construction company, family construction company. I mean, we did other things. Sarah and I threw a paper route for a while together, uh, multiple paper routes. And uh, I, I worked for uh, she worked for some businesses. I worked for some other businesses. Um, but at the time that we started our entrepreneurial venture, which is, um, just to, to give a, a rundown of that, uh, uh, basically, uh, online content, specifically on YouTube video content, where we share what our family does to have fun with our kids mainly and to learn and explore the world. Um, that's what we do. Um, and so you could call that a YouTuber, you know, but, <laughs> and most people do, but I don't really, I don't really associate with that term, you know? I understand. I think it kind of cheapens what you do to the, its most simplest form. Right, right. So it might be easy to say, hey, I'm a YouTuber because, <laughs> you know, where we grew most was, was YouTube originally. Um, uh, and so as far as, like I said, with my wife, Sarah, south being an entrepreneur or wanting to be an entrepreneur she started making money on youtube quite a while before i was even thinking about doing anything other than the business that i was working in the construction business you know <laughs> and right. um so and this story is just so long and deep and i guess maybe if we're going to go there maybe i should just kind of like start from the beginning and very quickly work my way through sarah and i were young we got together very young went through some rough stuff, um, uh, ended up staying together at a point in which a lot of relationships would just fall apart. And then we dedicated our lives to each other. We waited a long time to have children. <laughs> um, and um, when, once we got to that point, we just completely dedicated everything to each other and our first child, Axel. And so... Um, I uh, didn't have any friends, really. Uh, I mean, meaning I had friends, but I didn't spend any time with our, my friends, you know, uh, because our relationship was so difficult that in order to make it work, I had to spend 100% of my energy just focusing on her and, my, and our relationship. And so we're in a much better position now, but, <laughs> but um, uh Anyway, so, and then also, I wanted to be as good a father as I could be, and that meant any time I wasn't work, uh, that I wasn't spending working, I spent either with Sarah or with my son Axel, you know? And so, um, uh, but I was working 60, 80 hours a week, and, you know, he was around, like, probably around, like, she started recording YouTube videos whenever she was pregnant with him, right? And started making money off of that, quickly after she had her birth because she would record her natural birth process that she went through. Uh, she went down a, a more traditional route, I guess you could say, for, for birthing children. Okay. And she was putting that on the internet and it would get a good amount of views and she was making like $100 a month from YouTube, which was fantastic, you know? Um, and it fed her and... Um, but for me, I was just working a lot and investing in this family company and I became part owner eventually and got stock in the company. Um, but the trajectory there was at that company was, you know, if you work your butt off immensely, you might get to a point where you'll be a little bit more control on your time, but you still have to be, if you're in a leadership position there, you have to be the one who shows up the earliest, the one who goes home, right? You know, like, and that's always how it's going to be. My grandfather, very dedicated man, very hardworking man. He is still, to this day, the first person at this company in the morning. <laughs> he's not the last person to leave, but he's still, the, you know, almost always the first person there, you know. Um, even though he doesn't even technically work at the company anymore, right? And so that's the mentality of this family, which is, of itself, it's, it, it's, it's a good quality, right? Absolutely. But, but, you know, my, my father and my mother's marriage didn't work out. My bro older brother who worked at the company, his first two marriages didn't work out. Um, uh, my grandmother and grandfather, their marriage is still together, but they 
are, are from a, they're a different animal, you know, they're from the old school, you know, <laughs> definitely. And so, um, it, it was, wasn't what our family dynamic needed. And we decided that we don't care what we're doing. <laughs> We don't care if we are just like living in the wild, surviving off, you know, we just want to be together, right? And so, but in order to get that, we had to make some money. And so we we were like, okay, you know, you're doing something on YouTube. We see other people doing these things on the internet and YouTube. But the whole concept of online entrepreneurship seemed pretty scammy to me, you know, as far as a lot of things I saw. And so I was like, I really want to make, create value and know 100% that this is really helping people. This is really good for people. It's worth way more than the money that they might pay, right? Um, and then maybe charge them money, right? So that was the only way I could do that. <laughs> and also, a second thing is like, I don't have any time because I'm already working so much at this company. And so for Sarah to have her side gig, it would take up all the time when I would come home and watch Axel, you know, our son. Or if I were to have a side gig, I'd get off work and instead of playing with Axel and hanging out with Sarah... I would just be focusing on my side gig only, you know, and yep, I'm like, that's not going to work. That goes. Yeah, right. It's, it's it's tough, you know, and it's still how it had to be even, you know, but we were like, well, what if we do something together as a family? And then, you know, if we, if it works out, then it works out and we succeed together. If it doesn't work out, well, we tried to do something together and it didn't work out. But at least we have that learning experience together, right? Um, and and uh, and as long as we don't make it to where we like hate each other when it's all over, <laughs> it can be a positive thing, you know. And that means moment to moment, saying, "Okay, asking myself, is this really good for my family? Is this really good for our relationship?" And then moving forward, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, well, what does that look like when you have a four-year-old son? You know, like, what do you do with your four-year-old son that can be valuable to people that people will pay money for, you know, like, right. It's like, well, I don't, anyway. So what I did with him is I played with him and I was good at that. And what I mean by that is I was actually, I actually sucked horribly at that, <laughs> but, and this gets, this will really get in when we start getting into DB Cooper story, this really gets into this whole concept of like, what is reality? What is pretending and i was a very rigid person at that time i was like truth is truth facts are facts i don't tell axel anything that i can't prove as a fact a hundred percent right and then and in that sense i don't pretend with him you know i do with him like we'll go on adventures but i'm not going to pretend i'm this or you pretend you're that you know because i'm not that I'm me, I'm Patrick, you know, I'm your dad, you know, and I do this and I do that and I like this and that, but we don't need to pretend we're this or that, right? Because that's not reality, you know? <laughs> right. And so, and I know that's it, but it's like, that's how I saw things. But I found that basically he just, he liked to pretend, you know, and he liked to play and pretend. And, and so I, I realized that in order to actually get into his world, I had to be willing to do that. And also had to be willing to play with them. And so I was an awkward dad, a very, you know, I guess we all are, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, um, but I just, I just made it work. I just did it, you know? And so I looked awkward. It felt awkward playing with them, pretending with them, but I just did it and I found joy in it and I found that he enjoyed it. And so, um, and then I, I would start to find that kids would watch us while we were at a park. Like they would stop playing and watch us play. So like I know exactly what you're like, talking about. Okay, right, right. And so, um, so we, I, I and I, I noticed him one time. He, he, we were watching some truck stuff on YouTube, and when he was like four and a half, and this video popped up with this kid just playing with some trucks, and so he's just playing with his trucks and somebody's recording him, not narrating, not anything. This kid, it's just a really crappy video of this kid and playing with his trucks. And it has like 7 million views. <laughs> and that got me thinking, now, if kids are watching, like I thought this was crappy, but Axel's watching it. Other kids are watching it, obviously. I hope it's kids, you know, <laughs> not adults watching it. <laughs> yeah. And so I was like, maybe there's something here. And so... When Sarah and I are brainstorming, coming up with ideas, we decided, well, or I, I decided to ask Axel, I'm like, hey, 
So what if we recorded us playing and going on adventures like we always do and shared it with other kids on YouTube? You know, like that kid did with you, you know, basically by playing with his trucks. And Axel's like, yeah, sure, you know. And so that's how the first kid YouTube thing that we did was born. And my wife had been planning on doing some kid YouTube stuff that was just purely educational, really, or sort of like life learning educational, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because she's just now starting to actually, we're going to, we're getting into place where we can, we're actually going to do that with our daughter now, who's uh, four. We started doing it and um, me and Axel, I was super awkward. You know, you think I'm, I'm already awkward, but now I got this camera pointing at me, you know, and I'm like real awkward now. <laughs> And so um, we started recording that and we put it on YouTube and it was super slow. And I don't want to get into too much about the reasons and all that, because I, I know I, I really, we really um, we're going to get to the DB Cooper stuff, but it was just difficult at first for me. I was not professional. I was not good at this. I knew how to play though. And so I would like record with this little um, Sony action camera and I had, I didn't do any thumbnails. I just let YouTube pick them. I, I didn't put any music. I didn't really cut anything. I just kind of like, it was just, this is just us raw footage of us playing and adventuring. Long story short, we did that for about almost a year. We didn't make a dime uh, because I wouldn't release advertisements because I didn't want to advertise to kids. I thought that was terrible. I actually uh, listened to two podcasts that you were on. Um, oh, okay. Learning okay. to blog. Yeah, with and, Leslie. He's a great guy. Mm -hmm. Yes, good podcast. And what I really liked about that is in the first one, you said the same thing. Like, look, mm -hmm. I don't want to advertise to kids. That's not where I'm going with this. <laughs> and then oh, in the second that. one, you had, you had changed your mind by then and you guys addressed it. And well, for, yeah. I really like that. And I think that is where people learn. I mean, we're learning right. from your experience in doing yeah. that. Right. Yeah. So I totally, I, I think, I think I said on that podcast, I'll never release ads. I think I actually made that statement and I learned a lot from making statements like that. I don't really make statements like that anymore, you know, because <laughs> I learned that like, you no, know, why are you like, you're literally creating your rigid future reality without actually having experienced it, you know? <laughs> and so anyway, so yeah. That, okay. So that's interesting that, that, uh, yeah. So we, um, we just, uh, uh, and Sarah, she, she was really good at doing website stuff. She built her own websites from scratch, like learned how to do that. She is an incredibly intelligent, like just, just an amazing person who spent most of her intelligence, her life juice on raising Axel and our daughter river. But once she applies herself to any other area, she just excels, you know, immensely. She built a website. She built, um, uh, video hosting she built the subscription based deal we had it all ready to go to have the parents pay right you don't want the mm -hmm. kids to pay by watching ads we want the parents to pay and then we got pregnant with river things were very difficult we it was actually starting to get some views and we were like hey you know we could be making some money here you know and i think at the time it was like if we were making money on ads right now it could be like 150 to 200 bucks a month but that meant a lot to us at the time and so she's like, listen, Patrick, like, you know, we both believe in the same things, but, you know, it's either you, you got to release as on here. This is kind of ridiculous religious mindset that you're in here, you know? <laughs> and so we thought about like, okay, look, either our, the kids are watching other videos with, uh, uh, with ads on it, or they're watching our videos with ads on it. Because nobody else was doing this on YouTube, right? Like anyone who was trying to do to do the kid thing on YouTube, they had ads, you know. Um, right. And so it was like, what are we doing, you know? So released ads. Within a month, we're making a full time income. <laughs> and you know, I always look back and I'm like, I I just don't believe it's like DB Cooper. We'll get into this later. It's like I don't tell. I just I don't tell lies. I just I don't tell, like, I'll just tell partial truths, I guess. Is that what it was? Um, <laughs> and so I feel like that's what Google was doing. They're like, no, you know, it, it doesn't have, you know, it's not directly connected. 
but it's indirectly connected in a big way, you know, me meaning the views you get and how they suggest your videos on YouTube based on whether or not you have advertisements on there, you know? <laughs> um, so, cause Google says, no, we don't, we don't base it on that. And I just don't believe that that is entirely true. Right. Oh yeah. It can't be. Uh, yeah. Right. And so anyways, um, so we're making a full-time income and we're like, wow, this is incredible. You know? And so then it was just like game on, you know, and Sarah, so, so that channel was called the Axel show and it was really the Axel and daddy show. But for branding purposes, we we're like, it's simpler to do the Axel show. And now we've taken a step back from that. And, um, we're really, the Axel show is out there, you know, it, it'll always be out there. <laughs> and so I can't like get rid of it, you know, but this whole idea of, creating this face for my son axel that he didn't exactly have understand i suppose you, that'd be the best way to say it what's going on it's that whole child star thing you know that that right. there's, can be problematic do do that properly yeah and how do you and how did how do you make it where he can redo it later on or it's like oh no you're that kid who plays with trucks for the rest of your life, you know, like we all mostly know you as that, you know, and he's like, I'm so much more than that, you know, <laughs> uh, when I say trucks, it's because that's what we didn't really do toys so much. It's just he we just we just happened to record toys that he played with. And at the time it was trucks, you know, and but that's what ended up becoming mostly popular. And uh, but our adventure stuff was popular, too. So uh, just to take a step back, I'm sorry, what we did was record what we did playing every day. So if we're going to the park, we're going to a river. We're just like, hey, this is what we're doing. We're playing at the beach. We got our trucks. We're digging with them. You know, we're pretending like I'm the, one of the trucks and you're one of the other trucks. And it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's what we're doing playing in real life and recording that, putting it up. Um, so anyways, uh, uh, fast forward, uh, lots of stuff in between. My wife started her channel called South House TV. It was more of a family vlog thing. That became very successful. Um, and, um, I, I liked it. It was very holistic, you know, it showed a deeper look into our family and fast forward to adventure agents, which is what we started doing the DB Cooper series on and how I discovered you. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the adventure agents is me taking a step back, looking at what we've done and saying, what do we want to do going into the future? Right. And what's the next familypreneur step here? And when I looked at what we were doing that both resonated with, because we had, you know, millions of children every month who tune in, you know, and, and you know, tens of thousands of families. Um, and when I take a step back and say, okay, how can I, again, like we did before, like how can we create the most value possible? Um for these children and families and at the same time put our family first right um and so what i found is that the videos that we really loved doing the best were the adventure videos where it's just pure adventure there's no products or very little products is involved it's mostly exploration um, mainly in nature, natural settings, but anywhere really, you know? Um, and, uh, it just, it was something that was fundamental. And like I explained earlier, I think it's family adventure is something that's fundamental to us as a species to, um, to not just to, uh, I mean, you look at any animal, you know, and where there's any sort of family dynamic, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, adventure is a means of survival, right? It's not, it's not like a, um, recreational thing, you know? <laughs> um, and so adventure is still a means of survival for us. It just doesn't look like what it did in the past, but I think it's very deeply important for us to connect with those genetics, you know, like epigenetics <laughs> activation, you know, <laughs> because yeah, we especially forget children, especially children. Yes. You're right, exactly. And families, what that looks like mainly is with families, for me. Um, but 
encouraging it in so there's many children who watch who i know either their families don't have time to care meaning their parents or they don't have parents or their parents just don't care you know any anywhere on that spectrum you know because it's difficult it's very tough it was very hard for me to find time to adventure with our family um you know back in the day and so uh now we do it for a living but it was very difficult getting to that point and let me tell you just just to let anyone know who might be interested in doing something like this do not go into it uh lightly you know it, it's it is a tough gig to have your son as your business partner you know <laughs> oh i can imagine to have your uh, you know it's, it's tough enough for family businesses you know like general family like with adults but have your five, six, seven, you know, 10 year old son or daughter as your business partner, it is very, very difficult to maintain a healthy parent child relationship and have a successful business at the same time. Very, very difficult. So just, I just want to put that out there for anyone who's like, man, they're living the dream. I'm like, it is, it is more difficult than it is fun. I'll put it that way. But I have fun doing difficult things because I learn that that's where where there's dragons, there's gold. And that's a statement I really like to, a, a guy named Jordan Peterson talks about that. <laughs> um, and I really resonate with that. And so I, I'm, I have to be careful not to be too sadistic sometimes because I'm like, oh, this is hard. This is painful. Let's do it, you know? <laughs> and uh, because I know that there's gold at the end of it, you know? Um, so anyways, uh, so we, we decided to shift gears and really start focusing on something that's just adventure style and, and that that's that's family adventure and that is not that the name of it isn't my son right or me or any of uh, any of us individuals right the name of it is something that is not ours it's something that belongs to anyone who is wanting to tap into their adventure potential right that brand we started was the adventure agents and the ideas were agents of adventure and the concept of an agent like legitimacy you know a secret agent sort of thing is something that kids really like and identify with and have for a very long time you know ever since that you know and so um i still love it and i'm 34. Yeah, exactly right you got <laughs> it boom and so um anyway so that's what we started the adventure agents and it started off as something that was just on the axle show but we rolled it out into a new brand so the first series was on the axle show and the first series was just a fictional it was entirely fictional Every, everything that we did that was adventure was just like uh hey we're going out we're going to try to do this or we're going to try to explore here or you know catch some fish or um <laughs> There's one video where we are like surviving in the wild and we catch a snake because it's the only meat we could harvest. And, and I bit the head off of the snake. And um, that was uh, that was a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, that's what everyone said, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 Bear Grylls, Bear Grylls, you know, because <laughs> Axel, when he was four years old, was watching Bear Grylls, you know. And so, like, since he was a four years old he's like you know biting the head off a snake eating a live insect eating rotten flesh that you find somewhere in a frozen tundra like these are all like they're not everyday things but it's what you got to do to survive and and anyone who's willing to do that is a hero in my mind right um so there's nothing really out it's nothing strange about that right it's 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 abnormal but it's not strange it's 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 almost heroic and he so bear girls is his hero in, in a lot of ways and for me to emulate that in any way he definitely would look up to me more you know and i want to connect with my son and so i, ma I made this video a survival video and you know anyway so i i bit the head off of a live snake <laughs> <laughs> in fact i did it three times and so anyways i was like you know it's like this is, you know, this is what our ancestors did, you know, like they didn't bat eyes at, at, at things like this, you know, but basically there was a, in that video we did, there's an underlying message there and it had to do with death and had to do with the border between reality and fiction and 
what is real and not real is death what we think it is and um, life transformation we talked about nursing logs and how they are it's a dead tree but is it really dead because it brings life to other creatures who can't have like they've evolved to have their life with the death of this and is this you know the snake's life is transferred into us gives us energy did it really die or did it just change do we actually die or what is death for us you know all these important fundamental questions that um and, and we, we we use that as an opportunity to have that discussion and so anyways um uh, that video is no longer up by the way <laughs> we decided to take it down uh and i may do stuff like that again one day very like intense survival stuff but there's certain lines that I've learned not to cross with certain people, not because I think it's actually dangerous, but because I, I see how, like, you can't reach people sometimes if you, if you, um, are extremely offensive, you know, and well, even if you're not intending to be offensive, right? And so I had yeah, to there's an intent line. and perception, and you can't exactly. control people's perception, right? But you can learn to understand people enough to try to have a balance in doing that. And our intention is to, my message that I've said at the end of our videos, um, I, I've changed my message a little bit over time. When we first started out, you guys get out and, and, and have your own adventures, I would say. you know, Don't just watch our videos. At the end of every single video, I would tell them that. These kids, I would look right into the camera and tell them, don't just watch our videos. You get out and have your own adventures. And, and I slowly morph that into um, um, you get out and use your imaginations to live your life and love everyone around you. And it's specifically important, the message of using your imagination, because what you're doing is when you're on a screen, this, this whole screen thing that we're using, it's, it's, I think it's the, it's the next greatest step since the um, advent of harnessing fire um in our evolutionary uh development um because it's a manip it's the ability to manipulate light and once we were able to do that the, we took the ability to manipulate light into our hands it was an immense amount of of um uh growth and power that we took and um and so there's a reason why those are built deeply into the stories of antiquity and it's still here today. And so um, shaping the narrative of reality using the manipulation of light through screens, particularly when it comes to children, is something that is it should be scrutinized very much uh, by parents, I believe. And I was very careful because they can watch our videos and get the idea that, well, if only I had him as a dad, or if only I lived in their world, I could have fun like them. And I would correct them at the end of every video in case they were thinking that and say, listen, you can have just as much fun as we do if you just get out and use your imagination. Because see, if you're just watching a screen, what is on a screen? Well, it's the products of other people's imaginations. And if you're only a consumer of the products of other people's imaginations, your imagination will go dead. Right? I and, agree. And so... Um, and it will not only go dead, it'll be worse. It'll be manipulated and used to the ends that the person intended it. And um, and there are things, I, I believe things happen whether or not you intend it. So your intention might be, well, I don't really have an intention. I'm like, no, you have an intention. Everyone has an agenda. You, you might not know what your agenda is, but you have one. You know, Because if you're doing something, you have an agenda. <laughs> it might be a primordial agenda that you don't even understand, but it's, but it's taking place. So if you're creating content for children online, you may not understand your agenda, but you have one or you're a part of one. And so if that's just money, you're using your talents to get children's attention to make money. That's an, attempt, that's an agenda. And my agenda is not to make money, although that is part of my agenda, right? Well, you got to make a living. Exactly, right. You got to make a living. And, and so my intention is to capture the imaginations of children and then give it back to them with the adventure agents we shifted that a bit um and i just kind of let i just opened my heart and my mind to like what is it that what is the message that i believe in 
how would I put this into words? And, and, and so um, now our message at the end of the Adventure Agents is life is an adventure and love is the key. And we love you. And we're so glad that you joined us for today's adventure. You get out and use your imaginations to have your own adventures. And that is, to me, fundamentally um, true as far as, you know, what I understand about truth now. <laughs> and again, you know, we're hinting at this getting to D.B. Cooper and the nature <laughs> of truth and reality and what is real and not. And it's just so interesting. And so... Uh, like who is this person, DB Cooper or Dan Cooper or you, you know? And it, like, it's just so interesting. And are some things more true that would seem less factually true on the surface? And, and this is something that, uh, like, you guys you touched on on your recent podcast about. It's about the journey, you know. The event. It's like it's about the journey, and the journey it never ends. <laughs> and that's what yeah, I just. Listen to another podcast yesterday, and I heard uh, comedian Jim Jeffries say mm -hmm. that the rise is always better than the peak. Yeah, right. I was like, <laughs> that is so true. Mm -hmm. So you're like, man, like I gotta. You get to the peak, you're like, that was great. Let's let's go down into a valley so we can have another rise. You know. <laughs> yes. And that that might seem sadistic, but it's what you have to do. You know. Well, and when you're talking about pretending. I like to think of it as uh, adults tend to use the term being creative, whereas kids will use the term pretending. But I think a lot of right. times that can go hand in hand. That was the birth of the adventure agents. So that was completely fictional, right? Meaning I made every single thing up in it. The characters, the items. There was nothing about that other than my neighbor Al and myself that was actually grounded in what we would call factual reality, right? And then, so that series went immensely well. And and I, I just, I got it. I was a kid again. I was a kid. I was literally pretending as a kid again because I, I played with that edge of not knowing the difference. I, I would, I would push it with myself. I would be like, I don't know. Is this story real? You know, like, did I make this up or is this real? Like, I don't know. You know, I would really push it in my own imagination to where I was out there literally feeling it. I would get goosebumps whenever we would find a clue, even though I put the clue there, you know, like I would just live it, you know, it was so, it was so fantastic to be able to live that pretend world with my son. Um, but I still maintained this concern about the betrayal, right? Because Axel and him, they, even to this day, believe I don't know to what extent they believe, right? Because I can't, I can't ask them those questions. I can't get in their head. I know that Axel might have a little piece of him that's like, I wonder if this is dad, you know? But it's so small. And I think maybe he knows that if he asks me, it'll be game over, right? Because yes. he'll, he knows I'll have to tell him the truth because he knows I tell him the truth. And, and, and I have since he was a kid. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know even communicating him thing, things that I believe about things that are beyond this physical reality that I believe are beyond this physical reality. I always communicate it to him. Once we go beyond something you can feel, touch, smell, see, hear. Once we go beyond that, I make it very clear to him that this is what I believe, not what you have to believe or what you should believe. And you have to make your own decisions as to what you believe. I've always, ever since he was three, four, and we were able to communicate about these things. I was very clear about that with him. And so I started looking into other things. I'm like, okay. So I started looking up on Google, like unsolved mysteries of the Pacific Northwest, myths and legends of the Pacific Northwest, you know, and ghost towns and things. And, and then, obviously, I stumbled upon D.B. Cooper. And it came up as a suggestion, but I just thought, oh, I know that's some sort of like unsolved thing but it's not something that like i didn't understand that it really had to do with here so it took me a couple days of research to actually end up clicking on one of those db cooper videos or articles you know mm -hmm. and then oh boy <laughs> once i saw ariel washington and i saw like they i was like whole like part of my language holy shit this is so cool this is right here in our backyard, you know, 
And man, like my mind just started racing. And I just, you know, for the next two days, I just devoured documentaries and, and articles and, and uh, could not stop. I went down as your, your podcast is appropriate called the, the, the Cooper Vortex, you know. Uh, <laughs> it sucked <laughs> me down hard. And I had, to, I had to ground myself because I was like, you know, like, like I explained before, this whole talk time, like our mission is to encourage and inspire families to adventure. And personally, I just wanted to just bathe in this for a month, you know. <laughs> and so D.B. Cooper was an obvious choice. And boy, when I started really getting into the psychology of this individual, whoever they were, and into thinking about them and their intentions and what they did and what people, how people described him. Oh boy. It was just super interesting to me, (laughs) you know? Um, and so, so now we're into, and so I was like, this is it. We are doing DB Cooper. But when I saw the passion of these people like yourself who were trying to dig into this story and solve this case, I, I really wanted to, just like with the indigenous people here, you know, I wanted to respect them. I wanted to make sure that I didn't do something that, that they could be like, this is rude, you know? And so I wanted to sort of create a historical fiction again, but make it very clear that there may be aspects of fact and and truth, you know, when it comes to like, you know, factual truth, I guess you could say scientific truth that we're, that we're delving into here when it comes to the case. But anything I find, any clue or any physical object or note, right? It will be very clear to anyone who's actually deeply involved in following this case and trying to solve it, that this is not an actual clue, right? This is not an actual item that you could use as a, uh, as a, a proof of solving the case, right? And so I tried to make very sure that I did that. Oh, and one other thing is in these mysteries, I found it's a very neat way for me to meet really cool people. And I found that this whole sense of story, you, when you find the right person, they just fall right into it. And yes. I, I, yeah, so I would pay people to try to be involved. But what I found is the people that would do it for free, you know, they're the best. They're just the best because, and I would end up paying, I would make them take money, you know, because we make money on this, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't want people to, and, and they can see my heart and how passionate I am about this. And that can suck them in to do things for free, you know, naturally. And if they have a misunderstanding about, oh, no, no, no. Like the first thing I do is provide for my family. Believe you me. You know what I mean? So don't be, I'm making money on this. You know, (laughs) it might not be a lot of money, but it's enough for me to give you 20 bucks. You know, it's enough for me to give you a hundred bucks if you're really helping me out here, you know? And so I know you, any time you spend helping me is time you're not spending providing for your family. Or, or loving the people who are most important for you to love around you. You know what I mean? And I know that money. you also spend money making money. You spend time making money because you have to in other regards. So I want to give you your time back in that way. You know, so even if it just buys you lunch today or whatever, you know. But man, when you find the people that are like, I see what you're doing here. And I want to be in your story, you know. And, and I want to make my own story in your story. It's just so fantastic when you find those people. And, you know, so there's been this, there's this woman named Teresa who is, she's just a, a, a clerk at a antique shop up in, uh, oh, it's not Woodland, Washington. It's just north of Woodland. Kalama? I think so. It's called First Street or Second Street Antiques. Uh, anyways, it, she she's just a fantastic uh, woman, and she, I went in there, and I'm like looking all like I, you know people think I'm crazy, but but see I know they do, you know, when I'm when I'm in my when I'm trying to tell my story, 
And when, I, when I'm going out researching, I'm walking around, I'm looking for items. I go to antique stores, I go to secondhand shops and look for things that are like, this is a cool looking clue. You know, this is an artifact. The way I imagine Forrest Finn looks whenever he's, you know, what, and what they were talking about when it comes to story, you know, it's like forgeries, you know, he's like, mm -hmm. what's the difference? If you believe this is something, what does it matter what it actually is scientifically, right? <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah it gets back to that what is reality right and that's the point of using your imagination to me is that you're pretending over and over again and it's but you're pretend it's like it's a form of science you're pretending like what is what is a hypothesis it's a pretend fact right <laughs> you know what is science it's it's having it's caring about something enough to start come up coming up with hypothesis based on what you experience you know and then taking that hypothesis and weighing again against other hypotheses you're pretending <laughs> science is a pretend action it's it's like holy sh like once i realize it's like db cooper to me um this character this person and we get into this and it won't so I created this, uh, I'll take a step back. So we, we create, I started creating a borderline between fact and fiction. When I say that, I just mean what most people, even though pe most people don't really agree on the facts here, but what we can say, okay, that happened, right? Like someone found money, right? We're not going to argue about that. Now we might argue about like what it is exactly that that means, you know, what 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 it is that was behind that who put the money there if it came there accidentally if somebody put it who did it who put it there if it, you know all these things we might but you know there's certain things that we can just say let's move on it's not helpful for us to argue about these things right whether or not the money was actually found by a kid it, there's a certain point at which it becomes not helpful for us to argue about those things and that has to do with love to me you know is finding something that we can both stand firm on and take a step in a certain direction together, you know, and it's a dance. It's, it's really interesting. And so, I, so I started, you know, dancing that line between what most people would say, yeah, this is a firm step and mm, this is a, this is getting into, you know, you know, uh, imaginary waters here, but we have to do that in science to actually learn, you know, we have to create hypotheses, even if they're imaginary hypotheses, you know, <laughs> even if they sound absurd, even to yourself, you know, and, and in doing that, we, we started learning about this person, D.B. Cooper, or at least what we thought we knew about this person, right? And man, the more I started looking into it, the more I found that like, there's a D.B. Cooper in all of us, you know, and whoever this was, they did something, something that was very risky. And it was not only risky for them, but it was risky for other people. And you and I had this discussion on the phone earlier, but it's like, you know, so, um, and everyone watching this podcast or listening to this knows, I would say at least the basic story. So maybe I don't have to rehash that, but just fundamentally think about you're doing something that any number of things can go wrong whenever he's doing this, you know? whether or not he had an actual bomb, if it accidentally went off or it was a fake bomb, but like authorities go to some extreme because they think something crazy might happen, you know? And so, oh, yeah. they... I mean, when he starts this, there's really only three outcomes. You're going to mm -hmm. go to jail, right? You're going to die mm -hmm. or you're going to get away with it. Right. And going to jail and dying, the odds are way higher right. than, than getting away with it. So he's yeah. got to know that going right. into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you talk about, is he the kind of person that can remain calm? Because see, we view it as that. But I mean, there are people, you know, who are just so confident. They're just so like, I mean, yeah, the chance of me going to jail is high, but I live my life constantly at risk. And I'm not in jail right now and I'm not dead. <laughs> and so for someone living in that kind of world doing something like this might not actually seem as risky as it is to most other people right yeah that's uh, a good point 
and and so what and, and you 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 talking with the two women in the past about the type of person that Forrest is. If you're confident in your ability to talk your way out of things so much, you understand how people work on a fundamental level psychologically that a lot of other people don't understand. They don't even understand how they work psychologically. Like, so the guy, the people that he talked out of bringing him to jail when it came to forgeries might have walked out of that situation being like, wait, what the hell just happened? You know, like, I don't even know what just happened, but I'm walking away and I'm not bringing him to jail. I did not expect that. But it's like, it's too late. It's not like they can go back and be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you talked me out of this. You know, no, now you look like a moron. So you're not going to do that. You know, like. <laughs> Right. And they're having that realization in the car when they're driving away. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Oh it's like he swindled me. What just happened? Yeah, or, or yeah, either he swindled me, or I don't even know what just happened. What is reality? Like now they're questioning their own reality. Like all the people that I sent to jail before, I wonder if I actually should have done that. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like it makes you question reality, and, and and that's what we're talking about. You know, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this. Uh, what we're doing on the adventure agents. And, and so, you know, this person, DB Cooper, who buddy, like when I talk about how I question myself, like, like I talk about, like I've hurt people in the past, I've betrayed myself in the past. And I think if we all look back really hard and really connect to our hearts and other, you know, we'll find that we have betrayed ourselves in the past in a more deep way than even anyone else has betrayed us. And we've all hurt other people in the past in ways that we never thought we would, you know? And we did that. And in doing so, we took a risk, whether we were conscious of it or not. Understanding D.B. Cooper, we to understand D.B. Cooper, we have to understand our own selves, you know? And... Because if you look at what happened, it's a very interesting story. And you and I talked about this earlier about how if you really took a scientific approach to this and look at what actually came of this action he took by hijacking a plane, you know, stealing this money, jump, jumping out of a parachute, making sure he was never found, mm -hmm. if that's what actually happened, if he didn't just randomly, you know, <laughs> you know, fall in a river and get swept away and nobody ever found any evidence, you know. If you actually plan something like that out, meaning what he planned out was to create this inspirational hero villain mix, and he succeeded in doing it without actually hurting anyone. And when I say that, I mean, how do you, how do you determine what hurting is, you know? And so I guess you could say maybe someone like Tina Mucklow, there's some psychological, emotional effect that this whole situation had on her, right? Certainly. There's stress. There's the people who are on the plane who, who maybe thought, um, although they kept it pretty calm, I think, right? Uh, yeah, they didn't no tell. one on the plane knew they were being hijacked oh, until right, they right. were off the plane. Right. And so for them, it's like, oh, wow, dodge that bullet. That's a cool story. You know, <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's bad about that? You know, I mean, this is life when it comes to, affecting reality if if you're someone like this person this individual so we'll agree that this individual was an individual it wasn't a fictional character that tina made up and all these people made up on this plane right there was you don't believe that the crew was in on it and they made it up yeah that every like you know conspiracy sort of thing, you know like there was a meat suit on that plane right and most of the people although who knows that there might have been some that were in on it most of the people were just people being affected by this, not people who were creating that, you know. And so, um, <clears throat> although they had a hand in it, each of them in their own way. Um, it wasn't like a murder on the Orient Express situation, right? <laughs> you know, right. where every single person, you know, except, you know, Hercule Poirot. If you're this person, you... And let's just say that there's the possibility that everything that's happened that ended up happening on that plane, for the most part, was what they intended to happen. Right? Do you think D.B. Cooper, though, had intentions of becoming a folk hero? 
of becoming a legend. Well, do you think he could have had that in mind at that point in time? Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, whenever I created this story that I did, um, for, for both D.B. Cooper and the Maui Hook and, and the estate, like, there were so many things that I didn't necessarily, specific things that I didn't intend. But what it is exactly that I set out to do, I look back and I'm like, yeah, in my heart, in my spirit, I would say, which is like the collection of everything that I am in this physical reality, that happened and more. And there's just so much about this character when we, when we hear about how he was a gentleman and about how they, you know, he tried to give Tina some money and how he, um, there, there's just specific mm -hmm. things that you're like, he, obviously cared about his image and the way people perceived him he wasn't just trying to get some money and so i certainly i certainly have to say that it's it's a potential that this is all about story or mostly about story and that we do things like i i i allow my son to take risk to live life and I do things that I know I'm putting my son at risk. But, and we all make those decisions as parents, but we weigh a lot how important that is, you know, to do that, to just get people to actually live, you know? Because what is life, right? And what is, what is the definition of a good live life here in this time space meat suit, right? <laughs> and so I suppose that someone like this like the the end of the meat suit behind this character dan cooper not db cooper because I, I mean and it may be maybe he had something to do with the db cooper although i i don't think that's likely it certainly was dan cooper i think i really think that story was was a part of it and i'm not sure how like planned the story was but i know it was there i just i see too much evidence I, I agree with you. I think there was a story behind it because he, I really do believe he chose the name Dan Cooper based on the comic book. The comic. Okay, right, right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mean, too I, much of a coincidence, I suppose. Yes. Right. Yeah, that, that if I... If you're going to use a I, fake name, you could use anyone. You could right. be Bill Johnson. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could be whatever name you want. There's an infinite number of men's names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But and he, and he wanted Cooper. people to know that he intentionally chose that to give the story more validity. I, 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 I see that to me, you know, not, not just he picked it because it was something he cared about, meaning like he grew up reading the comics or he thought it would be neat to make a connection there. He wanted people to live a real life story. The people who are investigating, the people who will see this in the future. And that's what I want for Axel. I want him to see that life is so much more than just what I raised him originally teaching him. There's, there's so much more to it than that. And I can't just tell him that because it's too late. I already got my fact claws into his brain when he was four years old, you know? And, and that wasn't what I was trying to do, but it's how I see it now. And so I have to go deeper to reach him now. And story can't, it can't just be telling a story. I have to live it. I can't just tell him I love him. I'm going to cry right now. I'm sorry. But this is so deeply important to me that love isn't just saying, it, it, it's not saying something. You have to live it. And, and there's sacrifice there. And I had to sacrifice what I considered to be the safety of our relationship of me being like, you always know what's fact and fiction in our relationship. And it's been a hard sacrifice. And I'm in it. I'm right now I'm hiding in my truck telling the story because all of the clues, everything, once he comes upon the information that would be a cipher to the code that I've been talking to him in. What happens in his mind, I'm concerned 
and have always been concerned will look like extreme betrayal. Did you believe in Santa Claus when you were a kid? No. I did. You did. Okay. And I found out that I had some doubts. So I was probably nine or 10 years old. Mm -hmm. I was in the second grade, second or third grade. Yeah. And I I had some doubts that Santa Claus was real, Mm -hmm. but I, I could never get any confirmation or anything. And this is, you know, the internet maybe existed, but I certainly had no access to it. Right. And I was watching pop-up videos on VH1, Mm -hmm. and it was just what was on TV. Right. And there was like a Christmas version or something like that. And there was one that popped up that said, oh yeah, and speaking of Santa, if any kids are watching, don't look. And I looked around to (laughs) see if anyone was watching because, oh my God, I'm going to be in on some secret information right now. Yeah, that's the thing you say to kids to get them to look. (laughs) Yeah, and it's like the next pop-up on the some Christmas music video was Santa is not real. And I remember thinking, I knew it. I knew it. Huh. And then because I had a younger sister, then it became like, I'm in on the secret with the grown-ups. Right, so you did not I never felt betrayed at all. It so just, that's when you're a kid, everything's normal. So it's just a part of life. Yeah. The part of life or part of mine was that Santa was real until you found out. So that's interesting because my mom had a different experience. She felt extremely betrayed and she cried herself to sleep that night. You know, <laughs> when that happened, <laughs> but, right, you're going to say why she didn't tell me that, you know, uh, but my dad didn't either, but for a different reason, because he didn't like I don't know. It's not so much about story. It's about he didn't like what society had done to this Santa character, you know, and he did not want his kids. And I agree, which is why I didn't like tagging on to this. Like, and so to go back on on the Axel show, I did the pond monster thing, which is a really popular thing. But I did it because I, I had to get the attention of the kid. I had to find something that bordered reality that they actually believed in because see Axel was so used to knowing that if anything crazy happens, this is not real. Okay. Because I made him that way. Right. But if his friend believes it's real so severely, then maybe he will too. And that is what I, I so much appreciate this, this kid. He's a great kid. Him, helping me essentially without him even knowing it but i had discussed clear discussions with his mom about this the entire time we've we've had an ongoing conversation about being careful with her son as a stepping stone into the story with axel and um and so going back i mean i wouldn't tell my son about santa but i would communicate story in some form to him differently i mean i don't have that opportunity like i said so i have to i have to i mean i have to be super deep and live it i have to believe it and i do right i do believe that my imagination is so powerful that i can convince myself of things and i have in the past and oh, i think we've all done that we do. And I think we are still doing it. You know, I think what's going on with this whole coronavirus thing is a very good example of that in, in seeing people's different perspectives. There's what you think you know about D.B. Cooper, depending on what that is. So it's bad or good, you know. So there's there's the good D.B. Cooper and then there's the bad D.B. Cooper. And then there is the individual D.B. Cooper. And that is not that's the third. Right. That's the three. That's what I think we should be striving to to really actually see, you know, not let ourselves be pulling in any two directions, you know. Um, and so. I just and that's why loving your enemy, it's, you can either hate your enemy. Or love them. And what's in between, I think. And, and so what so what does loving your enemy look like? Right. Well, to me, it looks different than loving your friend. You know, so I can love a person and I'll be like, well, I love you, 
but you're about to kidnap my daughter. And so if I have to, to shoot you, to stop you from doing that, I'm going to do that. I love you so much that I'm going to stop you from doing something that I believe is so terrible, right? I don't hate you, but I have to stop you. And I think that, and I hope that you might respect me for that in whatever reality is beyond this, if there is any, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I'll see you on the other side and you'll be like, thank you. Thank you. That's the idea, right? So that's the three. That's the third option, right? And so whoever this person was, that they were trying to do something. And I don't think that we can just say that that was bad. And I think that's an important lesson to learn. And I find it so interesting that whenever you were having this discussion with the two ladies before about something that Forrest said, and that like, basically, is there a place in history for bad men, essentially, or men who have done bad things, you know? And mm -hmm. I think that's what's so fundamentally important that I really resonate with, with a Christian narrative. When I say Christian, I... I hate using words like that because it's something that was made up later. It's not, it's just with this narrative of all have sinned, right? Judge not lest ye be judged, right? Um, and it's like, if you don't understand that, then like, like there was a kid, I, I got a mess, mess uh, a woman shared a story of one of her kids the other day. And, and by the way, the D.B. Cooper thing is the most popular thing we've ever done. <laughs> like, so many children are just enthralled with this story. And I think we are when it comes to these hero villain types anyways. Like Batman. Batman's a good example, you know? You know, I would say that D.B. Cooper is, is like Batman. It's like a real-life Batman, except they're a little bit more on the dark side, right? Um... That's a good, really good comparison, actually, because if you look at what Batman's doing, it's all illegal. Right, um, exactly. <laughs> in but, the but sense of the word. But can really actually point to it and say, what they're doing is selfish? And I would say no. And the same thing with this DB, with this Dan Cooper, whoever's behind, the meat suit behind it. Can you say that what they were doing was selfish? You know, and, and that the original FBI agent, the old gentleman, was like, he's nothing but a common crook, criminal. I think that's something along the lines of what he said. And we talked about this, you know, before. And it's like, to me, that's, that's the one, right? Or the two. And so, and I'm like, it's not that simple. And I think that the, that the story is, it's not, the, the, it's not just that it's not that simple with Dan Cooper. It's not that simple with everyone. And so you can't just dismiss Dan Cooper. You can't dismiss the person behind him. And I think he wanted that. He wanted to show us that. It's almost like he wanted to show, hey, look, look, you think it's easy to judge me. Try to solve this case. Try to find the bad in this case, right? Because hopefully this will help you people to understand it's not so black and white. And imagining someone like Forrest Finn, who especially like everyone might think, it's like, how do you try to make your mark on the world? If you're someone who has done some things that that are like inside yourself, you're like, I'm kind of a jaded person, you know, like I've done some things. I look back and I'm like, the, like, I'm, I'm jaded. But see, the government made me do that. Right. The the establishment made me do that. Especially like if you were in a, a the CIA or, you know, because like the CIA, I'm sure many of those agents, they look back and be like. Ooh, man, like we felt like we were justified in doing what we were doing at the time. But looking back, I feel like I was tricked into doing something that I felt like was morally objective, you know? Or oh, I'm sure that. there's a lot of that. Right. And so imagining someone like someone who is a real, like if you're extremely talented and you're in a war like the Vietnam War, they probably used you to do a lot of bad stuff. You know what I mean? Stuff that oh, people yeah. look back on and they're like, you know, it's easy for us to now look at and say, 
that was horrible. I can't believe that you went along with that mission. You know, I can't believe you did that. And yet at the time, if they were in that place, what would you have done? Really? You know, how do you tell your story if you're that kind of person, you know? And to me, I feel like, 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 I just have a grudge, right? It's almost like I have a grudge against the fact that I exist, potentially, right? Or, or I'm sorry, or maybe, you know, depending on, because I don't know this person, you know? Or I have a grudge against uh, the authority at large in general. And I wanted to do something that inspired good common people and when I say that, I just mean just the, just the common person, while at the same time stuck it to, to the establishment and said, and, and did it in a way that you can't really say. Because see, if you're dancing that line, you got to be careful. Because what if he actually killed an innocent person, right? Yeah, then this then is the a whole, whole different thing story. Falls apart. Exactly. But maybe he was so sure he wouldn't that had we been in his position, we'd have been like, and we saw what come of it, we'd have been like, I can't make this decision. Meaning, I, it's not so easy for me to be like, just don't get on that plane. You know, just don't open that briefcase and give him that note. Just call it off. You know, it may not be so easy for us to look at all the good that's come from this and say, you still shouldn't have done that. You know? Because, like I said, we take risk all the time, you know? And it might be easy to point back at a family. Like, I know a family who they, they hiked the Appalachian Trail with their, like, they had a lot of, like, seven kids. And, man, they put their kids through some rough stuff together as a family. And they have this T-shirt that they have. They're called Fight for Together. And their T-shirt says, Safety Second. And, you know, all their kids, I know, because they made it through alive, and they already say this, I'm pretty sure most of them, and they already do, because they allow their kids to like talk freely on their YouTube channel and podcast. They're like, I'm so much better off now <laughs> because of that, you know, like that was difficult, but I, I know that I can do anything pretty much. Imagine the confidence that that gives you, you know? And so I, like dancing that line, I, I don't know. And that's the line I'm dancing right now. But I'm risking it because, see, my son might, there is a chance that he will feel betrayed and that will decimate our relationship. And from your perspective, because of how you experienced with Santa, you know, that's not necessarily the case. But see, I know with Axel, I've had certain things happen in other circumstances that tell me he might really feel betrayed here. But D.B. Cooper is real. Yes. Well, Dan, the meat suit behind Dan Cooper is real. But we don't know what's happening, you know, and it's like, we don't know what part is his story he intended or what part was just made up. And this is how myths work, you know, we know this. And so when it comes to Axel and this, it's such, I identify with him so much, potentially. And this is just a person I'm imagining his intention, right? But... I feel because of the evidence that I see in following the case so much that he had a, a, a much bigger intention that I identify with him deeply, I feel like. And, and again, this is all pretend because I don't know, right? This is all like science, you know, it's, it's a hypothesis. But based on the evidence for me, the hypothesis is very clear. We all have this D.B. Cooper in us. You know, and, and, and I haven't even gotten to the, something that's just, there's things that happen while I'm doing this stuff happens. And I'm like, Oh my God, is this real? Like, did I just create a reality that started? It's like, am I doing this or is this doing me? You know, <laughs> whenever I'm telling the story, you know, with the kids. And so it's just so interesting that 
I plan on eventually telling Axel, but I want to control that narrative. I began the narrative. I must make sure that I finish telling my part of the story in the way that I deep down inside want to tell it because I love him and I want him to know that that is what's most important, but I don't know exactly what that looks like. And there's this artist, this song artist that, and it's almost like DB Cooper is in the same place. And, and, and this whole Forrest Finn thing, oh man, I, I can't tell you how my mind was blown by listening to your podcast last night with these two ladies having to do with connecting D.B. Cooper and Forrest Finn. And let me explain why. And I think you might feel it too. You might feel that like, whoa. <laughs> Is that I've been, I've been just like constantly, like I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes, like deep in my heart, like what does this story look like, Patrick? And there's this artist called Sleeping at Last that like, they have this song and, and in the song they say, I don't have a script for this, but I know that the right words exist somewhere and I just need more time. I know, I know I'm asking for the moon, but I must listen to issue, intuition. And then he goes on the choruses, there's magic in our bones. There's magic in our bones. And see, I, I didn't believe in magic, but I really do now. Meaning I believe that there that there's that I'm not the only one that's trying to tell a story here. And I'm not the only one who loves my son or myself or the people around me. There's something else going on there. And there's just little clues that happen to that people mainly. And you're a part of that. And those women are a part of that. And Forrest is a part of that. And so I've been like, how does this work out? How does this story unfold? And it's not just my story, see. See, I want to tell my part of the story, but it's not my story, right? It, it, it's all of our stories. And so it's not just the story of D.B. Cooper. It's the story of all of us. We all want to make our mark and tell our story. And in order to do that, we have to take risks. And those risks involve people around us that we love and relationships. And so to think that D.B. Cooper, this Dan, this meat suit behind it, was a, was a sociopath potentially or or some selfish person who just wanted money. I just don't see the evidence pointing to just that, right? I'm taking a risk with this and with my relationship with my son, which is the most important thing to me, along with my wife. And my wife and I, our relationship is, is, is important, but only in respect to how our relationship together pertains to our relationship collectively as a married couple with our son. And so he, I have to communicate my heart to him and tell my story to him so that he can use it to shape his own story. And I don't want that to just happen by chance. I don't just want him to stumble upon the, the, the cipher without me being able to tell it. I, I, I want to, it to happen intentionally. I want our relationship to evolve intentionally. I believe evolution works intentionally. And so I've been just deep, deep in, I would call it prayer, essentially, when it comes to this, trying to, to work out the right words exist somewhere. And I don't plan my videos, right? Just like that artist said with this, I, I don't have a script for this. My videos aren't scripted. I plan things out, but then when I get in, I just, I just, I just let myself fall into it. And that's hard for someone like me because I'm a very religious person in that way. Meaning facts are facts, that kind of thing, you know? And so mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm always in the story. I never leave the story. I never leave the story. The story is more real to me than the, rea than the physical reality, meaning how our stories converge. I've been just in deep thought and, and like I said, prayer, meditation about what exact, what is this story, you know, and how do I tell my part of it? And Forrest Finn, the treasure there, I found very interesting. I found him, what I kn had known about him previously to be very, before listening to your podcast, you know? And over the past like six months, I've decided that it is time to take that step because I've learned to live the story myself. I now feel comfortable and confident in revealing to my son 
that I have been telling him a story in real life. But it's a story that I believe too. And the reason I've been telling him that story is because I've been preparing him for something big. But it's got to be something big. And that something is, for the past six months, I've had it in my heart, that something is going to be searching for Forrest Finn's treasure. And so for the past six months, I've been pondering over and over in my heart how I was going to tell that story, my part of that story, right? Because like I said, the adventure agents, it's not us. We are not the adventure agents. Everyone is the adventure agents. Everyone who chooses to adventure, you are an adventure agent. This isn't my story. It's I just have my part that I tell in that story and play in that story. And that story becomes reality and it becomes more real than the actual physical molecules as interpreted by science that you can view. Just like with D.B. Cooper and how the story has become more real than if you were to just observe exactly what took place. Like, like you were able to be somehow a fly on the wall. There's so much more to it than that. And it's so oh, yeah, odd. The whole D.B. Cooper thing happened in five hours. I've already done 40 on the podcast. Right. Yeah, exactly. There's just... And I think each individual has an infinite amount of potential story in them. You, me, there's infinite potential story. I could not tell your story in any stretch of time and space. And that's, that's, what, the na that's what the nature of consciousness is. That's an aspect of the nature of consciousness to me. What are we? Are, am I my finger? Am I my which cell? You know, like what, what is it that is me? You know, if you lose your finger, are you less you? You know, like what, what it, you know, and, and to me, we are more than just our bodies. We are our story. It's a big part of us. And so Forrest Finn's treasure is what I decided what we have been training for because we have been training for something big as agents and and so if you don't know um in the story originally there's this character called the game master and it's something that was actually um started by someone else on youtube i tagged on to it but it goes deeper than that the game master is something that it's pretty old it's an old concept um as far as technology is concerned but and there's many different things like dungeons and dragons there's a game master um and uh, uh, if you're the creator of a video game, you, you're referred to in some circles as the game master because the game master is the punt, the one who decides the rules of the game. And my son and his, and his son and all these kids who were watching, they've all been a part of a game. And I am the master of that game. I have been the master of that game, but the point is to help train them to be the, their own game masters, for them to become the masters of their game. There's this part, and, and I re reference um, New Testament and you know the Bible and things like that because that's such a deep part of me, um, and I can't get away from that. You know, like I said, I've distanced myself and gone back and like find truth and re good stuff there. But there's this part where I like to say somebody said that Jesus said at the at the Last Supper where Jesus tells his disciples. He says, no longer are you my disciples. Now you are my friends. And that's so important to me. Um, this concept that any leadership role is something that the, the intention isn't to enslave, right? It's, it's to give you more freedom. And so our role as parents aren't to shape our kids to what we want them to be, but to help them to be shaped the way in which we hope that they will both them and everyone around them will have the most best life possible. And that must involve their own input, which is another reason why we just don't like the public education system, because we don't think that for most kids that it actually is very good at helping with that. Although there's a lot of amazing people in it trying to, to do that, you know, um, some kids, it works out very well, some not. And so at least anyway, so, I want Axel to know 
and, and this might sound so strange the way I'm describing all this, but I, again, I've never talked about this publicly. And I'm taking a big risk doing this because, you know, there's always that chance that Axel could come upon this information before I actually get a chance to tell my story, which is why I can imagine someone like DB Dan Cooper, the person behind that, wouldn't want someone to just catch him red handed because then the story he wanted to tell would just fall apart. Right. Then literally the man is telling the story, the FBI. Yes. Right. And, 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 and that's why it's so interesting when it comes to this, this Forrest Finn. So Forrest and, 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 and the connection there and the potential reality of maybe this treasure that he has hidden actually contains something. Because see, what they were talking about, they're like, oh, I don't know that you'd be able to prove. Oh, I'm certain. <laughs> I am almost 100% certain that if someone is calculated and thoughtful as a person behind D.B. Cooper, Dan Cooper, and Forrest Finn himself, if those are the same people effectively, that what and, and, and if what is in that treasure box is something that actually attempts to prove that he is the one who acted out this D. Dan Cooper story, it will prove it. He thought about this already, right? And he maybe waited this long. And again, this is all, you know, like we're talking, we're, we're getting real pretend play here. You and me, we're stretching it, you know? We're like the, th the four-year-olds that are like, you know, oh, well, I have superpowers. Oh, no, no. Well, I have the super superpowers. You know, like we're really going to be <laughs> yeah. pretend play here, you know? <laughs> but man, what an incredible thought that if you could pull something like this off, and yes, people died searching for his treasure, right? Yes, people were psychologically, emotionally hurt potentially or definitely because of what he did on that plane. And yes, Yes, all these things, but man, I mean, that's a price we pay for existence, right? There's no guarantee with existence. In fact, I would say that one of the, one of the guarantees is that you will suffer. That's what I find so interesting about the, 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 the New Testament story, what, what somebody said that Jesus said there. It's like, you, there, there's suff, there will be suffering, for sure. If, but, but it's like, question though, if you're not suffering, do you exist? Would you even know that you existed if you just had all pleasure and no pain? If there was all light and no darkness, could you see? If there was pure pleasure and no pain, could you feel? Would you exist if there was not the contrast? And so, depending on the way you answer that, well, the bigger the dragon, the more the gold, right? I decided that this is what we're going to do. We are going to... I'm going to reveal to them that I am the game master, but not only me, everyone who helped me to train them, they are also the game master. And now you, because you did so well in your training agents, you are now the masters of your own game, or you at least have the opportunity. I'm giving you that right? The opportunity to become the masters of your own game. And, and that's not just me giving it to them, right? Cause it's not, but I represent that. I acted that out. Because to me, I believe that love is a who and that love is a perfect relationship that exists. It is the relationship that is the foundation of all relationships. And relationship is the most important thing in existence. When you think about what's most important to you in the world, I would say to me, it's the, it's, the, it's the relationships, it's the individuals, it's the people. Even if you're a selfish person who doesn't care about anyone else, think about what that is. If all you care about is money, you don't just care about money. You care about what money does for you. That's a relationship. It's just an extremely selfish one, but it's still a relationship. So fundamentally, relationships are the most important things. Whether or not you admit to that or not, you act that out, even if what the way you act it out is by hurting people to get what you want. So if, even if you don't believe that, that's what you act like you believe. So it's not about what you say you believe, it's what about what you act like you believe, right? And so I decided that Forrest Finn is what I was gonna go after. And D.B. Cooper, what's great about D.B. Cooper is that it's not over. It's, you know, it may never be over. 
right? And so do you think gonna, it'll ever be solved? Well, I think that if we solve it, meaning the physical case, it'll only open up the discussion about what's deeper. The story will go on. Why did he do what he did? We know now what exactly he did. Like the physical properties there. But why did he do it? And what does that mean for us? What does that mean? We question, now, wait, what, now what should I do? Because if what he did was so risky, yet it turned out good, well, what kind of risk should we be taking in life? You know? And we've already decided that we should not replicate what he did exactly right like yes uh, I, 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 I'm, planes I'm, is bad right and so this is what we determine with the kids in the video is that in discussion and i like to like i don't like to determine what i think is right and wrong with the kids i have certain boundaries i'm like okay you I, i'm not gonna let you hit my daughter axel you know like so if you just go up and push her down or punch her i'm gonna stop you but i mean i i, I try not to restrict you right I don't want to restrict your thought and your conclusions. And so I don't want to say, no, it's bad to hijack a plane. Okay, so if you think it's good, you're wrong. And I know that 100%. I, I mean, I believe that, but I'm going to make it clear that that's what I believe. It's not so easy for me to say that what this meat suit behind Dan Cooper is did, whether that was right or wrong or not. But I do know... And there's this other thing. I keep mentioning scripture. It's hard, man. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but there's this person, uh, Paul says, nothing is evil of itself, but to him who considers it to be evil, to that person, it is evil. And I think it's up to all of us. And I find that so fundamental. I find it very interesting that I would say, if you, if you talk to the average person who says, I'm a Christian, they would just, that would just flip their reality if they really thought about what that person was saying there. You know, is that what we're saying is nothing, no thing, no drug, you know, all the things that we could stereotype that religious people consider to be sin or whatever, you know, from that. Or, or even even a people who don't think they're religious, maybe they call themselves an atheist or whatever, what they say and what they act out as if they believe, you know, are two different things. And so... And, and, I, and I admit that that's my, me too. And I try to, to, to really find that boundary. Like I said, I watch myself closer than anyone else. Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. I keep my enemy, which is my own worst enemy, which is myself, as close as possible. I hold them to the fire, their feet to the fire, more than anyone else. I have to make sure I do that because that's the only way that I can love myself best and love other people best. And so when it comes to Dan Cooper... I think that it's 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 not so easy. And so when the kids, when I determined, hey, so we don't know what, whether what he did is right or wrong because we talked about the economic benefit, about the inspiration when it comes to people learning how to problem solve by thinking about this, right? About it, it you know, iron sharpens iron. It made the deep, it made the FBI better, better at solving cases. You know, it inspired them to be like, shoot. If this common criminal can make something that I can't solve, I better sharpen up. And maybe that helped the FBI to actually solve cases where people were really hurt. You know what I mean? That's another positive thing come from it. Yeah, it changed air travel security. Yeah, right? Hey, if he could do that, maybe that was part of it. And I know that's the theory. Like maybe he's he was CIA. He did that because they really needed to amp up security and they couldn't do it without having an example and they wanted the example to be something where no one got hurt rather than a bunch of people in a plane got blew up you know so that's another theory i don't know i, I find that less likely because i i really don't like when it comes to the government i just <laughs> i just don't see most government doing things that good <laughs> i think individuals free of government are capable of way more good than a constrictive government you know but who knows? You never know. Um, that's a different conversation. Um, and so, uh, man, you know, uh, uh, but, but I decided that's what I wanted. And so I don't know. I mean, we can't just say that it's not so easy to say. But we know that if I, I, I've decided for myself and both the boys agreed that if we were to go to get a fake bomb or a real bomb and go on a plane, try to hijack it for money, 
that would not, aside from all the other bad I reasons it's a bad idea, it wouldn't be something that's that we would consider to be loving everyone around us very well. It just wouldn't. It definitely wouldn't. Right. <laughs> You're like, you know, this, it's important. You know, for me, it's important to ask these questions. Anyway, so, so for Forrest Finn, that's what I decided. Like I said, months and months ago. And it's been in my heart. How it, but one of the big problems was, like I said, I found people along the way, and it's always been the best, that they were the game masters with me. They helped they were they helped us master this to set the rules the, the game master determines the rules for the game they helped me to determine the rules and i really like to let them have their freedom and so al my neighbor our neighbor al is a big part of this i mean this is a whole nother conversation when it comes to who's db cooper but man he just fit the bill perfectly so for those who don't know on the show there's a character that is our neighbor al and he's 70 some odd years old and he lives off the grid and the property adjacent to us. And he retired from being an engineer in the Portland metro area, um, Portland, Oregon, right around the time that D.B. Cooper, uh, the D.B. Cooper thing happened. And he's lived ever since without working a single job. And um, he is a very mysterious person. Even the people that are neighbors around there, they've been there for 50 years before he was there, say he's sort of mysterious. And he lives alone now. His family is in different parts. Um, nobody has anything really specifically bad to say about him. But everyone has their opinion, right? But they can't, like, nail him down, you know? No one, no one can say, Al did this bad thing to me, right? Kind of like D.B. Cooper, you know? But, but some people are like, he's great. Some people are like, I don't know about him. Some people are like, he, he has questionable company. But no one can say, Al did this bad. You know, you know what I mean? Right. He's just living outside the norm. So it makes people suspicious. Exactly. Right. And so we moved on to this property. We, we went to look at it to buy it. And he drove up in his truck while we were there looking at it. And the, 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 the agent that was showing us a property, they were like, now, there's a guy who lives there, and he's, he's kind of a hermit. And so, you know, basically he painted this picture of like, hey, I want to warn you guys. There's a potentially questionable dude that lives here, you know? And he does, like, he may not be that friendly, you know? Anyway, so he wasn't bad-mouthing him, but he was like, he was being honest with us, you know, as far as he was, as far as he was concerned, as far as he felt. So we... Um, so he drove up in his truck and he got out and I thought, oh, this must be that guy. So I got out and started talking to him and he was absolutely super friendly, kind, helpful, um, warm, and it made so much difference. And, and, and over time, and he lives off grid there. He built his cabin by hand. Uh, he, he has a water mill that runs a turbine for electricity and he has some solar panels. He gets his water from a spring that runs down from the hills and he's always lived that way. And he says he's going to die there. He said, I'm going to live here till I can't chop firewood anymore. And so whenever I started looking at DB Cooper, I wanted someone to help me. And he had already been helping me with, he was with, we'd hid things in his pond. He would play parts like he tells stories about Oh, I heard a noise or, oh, I've heard something. And, it, and it's funny how like when dad's doing it, it's not as fun. But man, when you have some other person, it's again, it's the three, right? There's the three there. It's like, it's the witness. It's like just one other, th you know, and that it works in courtrooms too. It just means all the difference to these kids, you know? And so Al's been very helpful with that. And he's this mysterious character already to my kids, but for him to play this. And, and so I started thinking about it. And I started adding things up before I even talked to him. I started being like, oh my God. And I don't want to give away where we live. Okay. I can't like, I had, we try to be very careful about sharing where we live. But I've already shared this on the show. We live decently close <laughs> to where the FBI originally thought DB landed. <laughs> And we live close enough to where you can walk from Merman Lake there 
which is where he could have landed in the lake. <laughs> uh, or, well, it wasn't a lake at the time. It was a river. And he could have hiked up the river where? To where Al lives now. And we actually made a video doing that. Me and Axel kayaked to a point in which we thought he could have crossed the river. And we parked our kayaks. And it's now late because they turned it into an electrical deal. And we hiked through two miles of forest, or two and a half miles, maybe three, you know, not as a crow flies, right, <laughs> to Al's house. And it took us a while. And it was dark. We were hiking through, you know, untamed forest. And there's cougars there. You know, we've seen, we've heard cougars around. There's, cat, there's all, you know, but, and we made a torch out of uh, fat wood. It was a survive, it was a D.B. Cooper survival episode. And we made it to Al's house. And I'm, you know, and, and Al agreed to be this character. But when I first discussed it with him, I said, look, dude, I got to be honest. For all I know, you are D.B. Cooper. <laughs> 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 and you check a lot of boxes age wise and all like I added it all up and I'm like when you retired like you're smart you're an engineer uh you keep to yourself maybe you were an accomplice right I don't know <laughs> and so I can't tell you a more perfect situation for him to become a suspect and he was totally willing to play that part. And he loved playing that part. And I can imagine, you know, imagine you are this person behind D.B. Cooper, like we're imagining potentially Forrest Finn is, right? Imagine you seeing it come up and die down and come up and die down and you being proud of the fact that your story has impacted so many people in a positive way, right? I've thought about that so much. Is and, he and if, reading these books? Right, exactly. Did, did he You're go saying, to some of the events? Mm -hmm. Did he read on the forum? Did he watch the Unsolved Mystery? Like you're saying, did he plant the money? Which to me is is pretty astronomically, you know, I mean, to plant the money and think that some random kid's going to dig it up or person, to me is pretty, that's pretty iffy, you know? But maybe he knew that area really well and he knew that people often dig fireplaces there, you know? And that maybe he was smart enough to find a place where he's like, within the next few months, this is going to turn up, you know, someone's going to turn this up, whether, you know, it washes away or, and maybe he planned on doing that. Like originally he weathered the money, a number of them, and maybe he planted more than just that money. We just saw what got dug up. Maybe this wasn't about the money at all. Again, he never spent a dime of it. And maybe he wanted to prove that. Maybe we'll find the money in the treasure. Maybe the, what's in the treasure will lead to another treasure hunt that'll be the D.B. Cooper money, and it'll prove I didn't spend a dime of this money to prove his the weight behind his story, right? To show, not that he was innocent, because it's not about being innocent. It's about knowing that you are honest in what you said you were trying to do, right? Al is, is one of the game masters. And he's helped me with the D.B. Cooper deal. He's played that role so well. And, man, I mean, does he play it well? Or Oh, gosh, it's just great. Uh, and I, I, like I said, I, I still, you know, have a part of me that believes that he's somehow involved. My daughter asked me if I thought that he could be the real D.B. Cooper. Right. <laughs> now well, I was like, he could be. He could be. No one I, knows. You know, no one does know. I, I think there's certain things that I'm like, mm, I don't know, you know. But whatever, somehow involved. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, and, and you know, there was a parachute that was found uh, in that area too. You know, so or some kind of thing they thought was a parachute, right? Yeah, uh, I believe there's oh, two here. different parachute finds in that area: right. one in La Center and then one in Amboy. Right. And so, anyways, um, who knows? But. Uh, Al is a game master. I'm a game master. Kahu's a game master. Whenever I reveal myself, I decided that it's not going to be me. I'm, we're going to get some kind of note from the game master. Oh, oh I'm sorry. So at the adventure agents, we were recruited by the game master to be adventure agents. We got a note. We found a note at the end of one of our mysteries. And we ended up figuring out that the game master was basically testing us in that first mystery to see if we would be able 
to train to train and to actually solve other mysteries. And then that catapulted us into another mystery. And then I got rid of the game master because I decided I wanted to get rid of this character because it was too closely linked to things that other people were doing online that I didn't want to be associated with. Um, and search game master and you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> it got, pretty, <laughs> it got pretty weird and gross and just, I, I didn't like it. And so I didn't like being very associated with that. So I wanted to get away from it because again, the, my son, he's not an actor. I don't know anyone else on the internet who is doing or has ever done anything like we're, we're doing. And I can see why, because it's a, it's a tricky game. He, this is a 10 year old kid, you know, he's, he's pretty smart. You know, the potential, like I said, for betrayal here and how careful I have to be. I mean, I got to be so careful that everything looks legit. There is no, Put, I mean, he doesn't hear me talking to people about things. I have to keep it hush hush. I have been so careful because these these two kids are smart kids, you know. And so, I have to make it seem very anyway. So, basically, we're going to get a note from the game master that tells us, "Hey, I, it is time that I reveal myself to you." And we're going to go somewhere to meet them. Whoever I can get to walk out to meet them. Uh, basically, we're going to go to a place, and then all of a sudden, Al, D.B. Cooper, <laughs> is going to walk out, and whoever else I can get that has helped me take part in this is going to walk out. So if it's Teresa, then her, also Kahu, him, or it'll just be Al. It'll da Al will definitely do it, and they're going to be like, I knew it, because we are on to Al to be both D.B. Cooper and the Game Master, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so... But what I plan on doing is then I'm going to walk up and stand next to Al and turn around. And then they're going to be like, oh. And that's the point at which I am taking a risk here. Because I don't know exactly how they're going to respond. So I'm taking a risk. But I have to tell him the science, I suppose you could say. The facts. At some point. But then... I'm going to tell them that, like, immediately, we are the game master. And we have been training you for something big. We knew that you, in order, that you, in order for you to actually train and train well, we had to disguise our identity. And now we believe you are ready to go on a mission. And that mission is to find the treasure of Forrest Finn. And then we're going to get into that and how deep that goes, right? And how hundreds of thousands of people on different levels have searched for it for, for a decade. And how people have died on that search and how people have gotten injured and risked. You know, it's like, this is no small thing that we're about to embark on. And you needed that training. And though I always haven't always planned for them to, to find Forrest Finn's treasure, like I said, except for the past like six months, I have always planned for them to do something, right? And so, and at that point, what I was hoping is that I could have someone just like Al, just like Kahu, just like Teresa to solidify the reality of this mission, of this hunt, right? And what I was, and the obvious person to me was Forrest himself to be as soon as I reveal that our next video is us going to meet with the, the man himself. That would be incredible. Because see, I mean, and I, and I told you this in the beginning, you know, like what I'm trying to do here is encourage and inspire families to get out an adventure. And when I read Forrest's story, it hit me hard. It seems like that's what he's trying to do. Now, not necessarily families from his verbiage, but people. People, yeah, but definitely. What are, what are families? They're people. It's just a certain structure of society, you know, you know. And so my mission is families because we are a family. And so that's my part to play in this story in life. But what I want is for is for people to just to, to get that bug 
reactivated in them to get out and do something. I feel like we're, we're, we're headed towards slavery in this society really fast. Slavery to AI, slavery to technology, slavery to those who own technology. Because there are individuals behind this technology and behind this AI. And, and it's, it's coming quick. It's compounding how fast it's coming, right? It's exponential. People are losing jobs. It's going to happen more and more and more. And the future is going to be determined. Those who are less creative and who weren't encouraged to be creative in the past are going to get hurt the hardest. Because they're not going to be able to roll with it. And I was one of those people. And I just want to wake those people up right now and say, Get, use your imagination before it gets taken and you get, become enslaved. Because that's the nature of this. It's not human. And it's a tool. And tools can be used for good or for really bad. And it's up, up to us to determine that. And so I, I just feel like Forrest lived a life that though it was hard and though it was super risky and edgy and he's probably a has a dark side like we all do but that he sees more clearly well how do you find that well you find that in the chase in the adventure and what keeps you going well part of that is the thrill of the chase you know and so that that's so appropriate and like him, I want, I want these people to feel alive again, to feel the thrill of the chase, and specifically as a family. But again, fundamentally, as individuals, mostly, most importantly, as individuals, but specifically for me, right, as families, whatever your family structure looks like, which to me is um, just two or more people. Like I said, the two or more, you know, and again, it goes back to, and I hate doing that, the two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them, right? That's love, right? Two or more people acting out the best way that each of them has determined with each other how to make their world a better place for both each other and everyone else around them. That's the best way I can describe love. And in that way, it's an action. But fundamentally, I believe love is a who. And if that's who Forrest is, and if that's what he's trying to do here, that and more, then I feel like we align enough for him to potentially give us his blessing, I suppose. Right? And so... I, I, I've been thinking about that for a long time. And like I said, it's just so insane. By insane, I mean amazing and just mind-blowing that you messaged me out of the blue because your daughter happened to find our stuff and your last episode happened to be Forrest Finn and my stuff happened to be D.B. Cooper and my next plan from D, step from D.B. Cooper happened to be Forrest Finn. And now Forrest Finn might be D.B. Cooper and the treasure we wanted to find might have the proof that he is D.B. Cooper or something that leads to something like that. And even if it isn't, it doesn't matter. It's so cool. <laughs> Could you imagine if you open the lid to the treasure chest? So yeah. forget about the whole finding the treasure chest. You open it up. It's got cash and rubies and gold and all the other things Forrest says are in there. But then it's also got a bundle of $20 bills. <laughs> How crazy would that be? You know, it's one of those things where it's like, what is life? Who are we to say what happiness is for other people? Who are we to say what people who take risks in their life are foolish because they died on the chase? And man, I just see like there's people who are talking about living forever or living indefinitely now, you know? It's like, we're going to live indefinitely, you know, transhumanists. It's like, we got to get to what we can live, you know, a thousand years, 200 years. And I'm like, but are you happy right now? 
And if you aren't, why is it that you think that extending your life to 200 years will make you happy? Why is it that you think that extending our lifespans to 200 years is going to make us not torture each other more and hate each other more? If we can't figure out how to love each other, work with each other in a positive way, you know, as determined by each of us individually and collectively in this short span that we have currently, why is it that we think that just extending that span is going to be the thing we need to make that better? And so I do imagine that finding those 20s would be like, it would mean something that would be akin to what I would describe as happiness. Not that that is happiness, but the reasoning for that is so deep. It's so much more than, and this is so, it's so hard, man. I got to tell you, like, even you asking me that question, it takes so much willpower for me to just shut my religious self up and say, Patrick, it's not futile completely to sit and imagine that you find those bills in that box. Because I'm like, I can imagine this, imagine that, but it, but imagining something just for the sake of like, wouldn't that be fun? That to me is so selfish that I just don't do it. But can I actually- Oh, I do it all the time. Well, what, what I'm saying is, is that a skill that you have to love yourself that I am too afraid to exercise, to love myself? And if I can't love myself, how can I love my son? And so by learning a skill like that from someone like you, just in a simple way of you like asking me a question, and me being like, okay, Patrick, you respect this person, and yet he's asking you to do something that you think is so futile. But why would you, if he does it, and he says it's good, and he thinks it good for himself, and he's asking you to do it, and you doing it is literally just, le- literally like, could consider to be like, what is love? It's an action towards someone else that is, you know. And so me just imagining that and and going with your question and answering your question in an honest way, isn't that loving you? I know it sounds crazy. I have to make things so complicated. You just asked me a question, you know, but like, this is (laughs) what I have to go through to like, because like, and so to answer your question, I don't think about things like that that often. And if they do, it's a slip up. It's a mistake. It's like, oh, no. Okay, Patrick, stop going into fantasy land right now. Let's focus on what can actually help people, you know, or can actually help, you you know, and so, or can actually help you help people. But it's like, maybe me being the kind of person that's willing to actually fantasize a little bit about what I want every once in a while, what I think would be nice if something happened is one of the best ways I can love other people because I learned to, to actually love that person that is myself. And so I think that that would be so neat. I think that that would be just super neat. And it it would be neat. <laughs> right. And I know it sounds so it's like, well, duh, you know, but like it, it really is something for me to say that, you know? <laughs> um, and so, man, but, but, it, but, but it's like, but that's, what's the three, right? So here's the three again, man. And I, and I seem like really strange talking about the three all the time, but like, so what if that didn't happen? Or what if that did happen? Or what if something else happened? Right? (laughs) And that's the three. And so I don't think that that's exactly what's going to happen. I don't ever think that what I imagine is exactly what's going to happen. And I don't really want that to be what is exactly what happens either. Because... If that was what happened, then it means that I would be in control of everything that happens, right? Or completely in control of one thing that happens. And so when I say I want to control how this turns out with me and Axel and this whole story thing, I don't mean that I want to be in complete control of it. What I mean is I want I don't want to be caught red-handed. I don't want to be caught with my pants down. I want to make sure... I did everything I could to make it turn out as good as possible for our relationship. And I want to know that I did that. That's what I want. So 
What that means to me is telling my story the best way I can. I'm not trying to solve the case of D.B. Cooper. I'm just trying to like figure it out and learn from it along the way, you know? And I, I just think there's so much treasure behind this D.B. Cooper dragon, you know? <laughs> well, what I appreciate the most that you're doing with D.B. Cooper is introducing it to a new audience i mean my daughter came up to me and said this is like eight months ago or something she was like mm -hmm. hey i found this new youtube channel and they're trying to solve the db cooper case and i just kind of rolled my eyes and was like okay that's cool and then a few weeks go by and i'm watching a couple of them with her and i'm like okay i actually enjoy this and it was refreshing to see a youtube channel that I, what's the right word here? That I approve of. I mean, <laughs> that's not the right word, but. You know, man, like you. Kids you, watch you know, some weird stuff yeah. on YouTube that mm -hmm. I don't even understand. For a while, my daughter was watching this series of videos where this adult woman was playing with dolls and yeah. doing the voices. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it would drive me crazy. I was like, my daughter's name's Katie. I'm like, Katie, you have those toys. <laughs> Why are you watching this? Yes. Oh my gosh. Man, I, I was I was both you and then that person and that like I mean I did it with my son. You know, but I was that. I, I was the guy who was I had a monster truck and I'm like, oh hey, what do you want to do today? Oh it's cool here. Okay. You know like and then I would I was so awkward. It was so, and, and I would say a few parents saw that I was genuinely cared, you know, but it wasn't so obvious. And for just a random person picking out one of my old videos, you go back and look and you're like, this is, this is very weird, you know? And like, you can like, you know, and I would have to agree with you totally, you know? Now, there was a difference between what I was doing and what some of these other adults were doing when they were just like, you know, but again, I can't judge them because I did some of the same stuff, you know? And so I don't know their intention, although there's some that I'm like, I don't trust that person at all, you know? <laughs> like, I definitely would not let my kid watch that person, you know? And I'm not going to name names, but there's a few people. And, you know, when you lie about small things, you'll lie about bigger things. And I've caught some you know certain youtubers in discrepancies and, and like one in particular in a lie and i'm like look when you lie and it comes to serious things about children which is why i'm very careful about the way i talk about things word things when it comes to kids you, you're i'm sorry you're <laughs> you're gone you know <laughs> you, you 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 uh my kid's not gonna be watching you you know and so anyways um i just really appreciate that um, and when I say that, I know you don't necessarily mean it as a compliment. I understand that what you're saying is really what you think, you know, and I've gotten that from a number of parents and it really feeds me and encourages me to continue because see, like I said earlier, what I set out to do was provide real value. And I, and I mentioned this to you on the phone when we talked first, it's like, I'm going to create value and I'm just going to do that for free. And like, and then once I know. I know that you are really getting value on this. Then I might somehow figure out a way to get the thing that is most important to you, which is money. And when I say that, I mean, if you spend time, most people trade time for money. Most people. Yep. And time is your most valuable asset to love people and I do not want to take your time your most valuable love tool away from you frivolously I have to be sure that the product that I am making for you is something that is worth definitely more than the time you spent earning the money and so experience is the best. And I want kids to experience our adventure and be inspired to go out and experience themselves. And D.B. Cooper has been the biggest thing 
uh, storyline that has actually inspired kids to get out so many parents' messages. Their kids are always wanting to go out and look for D.B. Cooper clues. Always. <laughs> it's huge. Good. Man. It's so huge. They love getting out and looking for D.B. Cooper clues. Because, see, he could have ended up anywhere. He could have he could have jumped to another country. He could have gone to Australia, you know? And we have people from all around the world wa watching us. He could have hid out in your in the woods in your backyard. Go look for him. It's so infinite. It's so awesome, you know? It's just great. I love it. And I want to keep going with D.B. Cooper because even once I reveal to my son the character that I played here, D.B. Cooper is still a thing, <laughs> you know? And it's just so neat that it that I can also say to them when I say this, I have both a treasure hunt for you that's real, and this treasure hunt is potentially connected to the D.B. Cooper case. We have a new suspect. So we're doing both. So I can do the D.B. Cooper, Forrest Finn story. And this whole thing on memes online, you know, like if you know anything about YouTube, um, you know that these people that are like, there's these people that are super good at manipulating algorithms. I'm not one of them. But one of the ways you do it is that once something becomes popular, you tag right onto it. And you don't let up until it dies, right? D.B. Cooper is the most popular thing we've ever done. When I say that, I mean generally. There's lots of things we've done that becomes popular, but it's three-year-olds watching something 10 times in, in a week. You know, That's a different kind of popular than you have much older children and adults genuinely interested in the story you're telling. And they're waiting because they're like, hey, I know there's, tr there's actual fact to this. And anytime I talk about something that's like another part of the real D.B. Cooper story meaning real evidence, that keeps them going. Like you were saying, like, oh, I actually kind of enjoyed this. You know, I've gotten a lot, so many parents talk about that specifically when it comes to not only the D.B. Cooper thing, but the Maui Hook thing. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, it's just we did a Maui Hook series where we found Maui's hook. Like on Moana, I did like a pop culture cross thing, you mm -hmm. know. And so this, this guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, he says something that I really find fantastic, and that is... You have your perspective. And I'm like, I don't really know that that's all I have. And it sounds very psychopathic when I say that. Because imagining yourself as someone who is looking through the lens of, of a meat suit, you're not actually in control of what you're doing. All you have is your perspective on what's happening. Well, that sounds like a psychopathic excuse. You know what I mean? And so I don't exactly mean it that way. But I, I mean it that you definitely have your perspective. I'll say that for sure. I don't know exactly what else you have because I don't know why exactly I do what I do most of the time or why I think the thoughts I think or where they came from or where the desires for me to do the things that I did came from exactly. Now, I'm constantly watching myself. And so I believe I do have control, but what that control is, I'm not exactly sure if you understand what I mean. Oh, I definitely understand what okay. you mean. I think okay. about that a lot, like even having conversations with myself. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Like, yeah. What is that? Yes. Because mm -hmm. when I hear him saying like, I just have a grudge, I don't think D.B. Cooper was saying, I just have a grudge. And he has like this deep hatred in his heart. I think he, he might have said it sort of lightheartedly, like, I just got a grudge. You know, him saying, I just have a grudge. He knows what people are going to think when they hear that, you know? And it'll be any number of things. But it's almost like it's a disguise. It's like, hey, do you really want to know the truth? You're going to have to read between the lines here. Because I'm not just going to tell you the facts. Right? And, and, and hearing Forrest say, or hearing that Forrest said that, hearing that Forrest said, I don't, like... I don't tell lies. I just tell partial truth. Was that what it was? Yeah, something like, right along those lines. Yeah, it's like I, I don't mean, tell lies. I only tell part of the truth. Right. So what's like the fun in hearing the whole truth? Well, then you don't figure it out for yourself. But if you get pieces of the puzzle, 
then you can have the thrill of the chase of putting it all together, you know? And so if he, what she said about like, like we asked Al, are you DB Cooper? And he says, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. That's what he said. That's what Al said, you know? And it's like, he, she asked him if he, uh, Forrest is DB Cooper and Forrest is like, no. Well, I mean, that's true. I'm, I'm Forrest Finn, right? Like I'm not DB Cooper. Are you asking if I jumped out of this plane on this time at this day, you know, like if you ask me some very specific questions, then I might so specific that in order to answer you a yes or no, I would have to lie. Right. But that's not what she asked him. And I would imagine at that point that he might be like, what do you think? You know, <laughs> it's like, dang it, you know, <laughs> um, I just, um, I just find it so interesting and I do to answer your question and a question you didn't ask, but a question that I'm asking myself because you, you're helping me to learn to ask myself these questions, meaning hope. I, I'm not a very hopeful person. When I say that, I mean, I don't like to hope while gambling at other people's expense, Right. I hope things work out really well for everyone and I'm willing to have hope for that. But for me to have hope for something specific to happen feels a bit selfish, right? So if I were to say, I hope that if I asked you to ask um, one of the, those ladies, I'm terrible with names, so I can't remember their names. Mindy and Stephanie. Mindy and Stephanie to email Forrest and ask him for me if he saw him as if he saw or could imagine our stories converging somehow with some input from him whatever that might be then um i do have a hope that that might happen because see like i said it, it, it it's it's number one is my family and my son but it's also everyone else. And so I think it could inspire so many people, specifically children, to converge the D.B. Cooper narrative, which is the most popular story, and the good that it's brought and the inspiration it's brought for them to get out and actually adventure on themselves and to see life as a mystery and to try to solve for the sake of solving it and for the sake of what that means for them and the people around them. And converging that with this interesting man and his interesting story and the fact that they might be connected or maybe not and whether they are or not doesn't really matter that much to me it's just the thought that they might and the reality that they actually do converge right even if they don't physically converge with the money or the you know what i mean like the person is the same person their stories are so clash similar, you know, it's so like, and so just the mental experiment and the imaginative reality there is so interesting that just acting it out and figuring out that they don't connect would be so fun. And I feel like he could be a very powerful part of that for many thousands of families and individuals, tens of thousands, millions of individuals, you know? Yeah, and what you do so well is introducing these stories to children. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many our age, we're, we're the same age, how many people do you know that are 25 to 35 who don't know who D.B. Cooper is? Yeah, there, there's like, I would say it's, it depends on where you are. It's less people that are 25 and 30 more people like you know the older you get my grandparents and my dad they all know very well who db cooper is you know or oh, yeah the care you know uh but once you go down that number line i have heard of it i had heard of him but i didn't know you know and you know the first time i heard about it was in the movie uh the only movie that i know of popular hollywood movie that actually discussed that in, in a very in-depth way. And when I say that, I mean, they integrated it 
in the storyline was up the creek without or, a paddle without a paddle yeah yeah um that's where i first heard of db cooper um and so yes i mean not many there's very there's there's less people that are 25 that know and a lot of these parents their parents are six seven eight year old kids you know and they're yeah they're like between 25 and 30 years old and most of them have the same thing. They don't, they, they've heard of D.B. Cooper, but they don't really know the story, you know? And seeing it told in this way, it's just like, wow, you know? And, and I want them to, to hear the story of Forrest Finn. Because even as Forrest Finn is a, turns out to be a selfish, narcissistic, greedy, you know, like, which, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm just going extreme, you know, on one side. It doesn't matter because he's a person. He's a person. And people are interesting. And people are worth investigating, even if they've done bad things. People are worth loving, even if they've done bad things. Yeah, people are complex. It's not all just good or bad. It isn't, yeah. No, I, but what I, I like to use those extremes to be like, okay, like, pick your person, okay? And tell me that there's not something deeper there. Like, I really do believe that line, the line between good and evil runs down the center of every human heart. And if you don't think that you have the potential to be like that person or worse, you've got another thing coming and you've got to watch yourself. And we have the responsibility of learning from our past ancestors and the terrible things they've done. And not just assuming that we're better than them. It's just... Um, is so interesting and I do think that that would be neat if we brought these stories together especially if they were actually really together <laughs> in the background you know uh, but well it's uh, a possibility whatever. you think so I really do think so okay. I mean is there any evidence that Forrest Finn his brother or that gentleman Donnie are not involved and right you, you know from my point of view no and, and, there isn't definitive evidence no, that all three no, of them I, are I, not exactly involved. And, and and i'm not but but like again like i'm not trying to like i can understand that if if you did open that chest and there was definitive proof that he was that that he's risking and maybe maybe he's the kind of person who used to be like oh i don't care if they find out That'll just make it more fun, you know? And now, like, they're saying he's changed his attitude about things, and he's more like, wait a minute. I, 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 maybe he's coming down from this high of, and he's realizing, like, I love my family. I love my kids and my grand. I, I don't want to, I really don't want to risk going to jail. I, I was kind of risky in the past, but I'm, 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 I'm actually coming away from that, you know? And I, I, I do want people to find this treasure, but I don't want them to find it while I'm still alive. But I feel like also, if that is the case, that we're not actually risking that happening. <laughs> At least, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of those weird, you know, I was telling you all about the phone, I'm like, oh, I could find the treasure. And then I'd feel kind of bad because like these people spent their lives searching for it. And then a couple kids and then some silly dad finds it, you know, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> kind of insulting. And I'm the kind of person that I'm like, I was never competitive. Cause I just didn't care about winning that much. I was like, what is winning? I don't know. Like I got more points than you. I dominated you. What I was like, whatever. Like I just, I just want to enjoy myself and know that you're enjoying yourself too. So I'll let you win, whatever, you know, um, it ended up being sort of a mistake with Axel because he does care about winning and that's okay. You know, it, it's different personalities, you know? Um, but I, I let him win. And I realized that that wasn't respectful to him because he does care about winning, not because he hates other people and he wants to like blow them out of the water, but he cares about the concept of winning in physical reality. And my concept of winning looks a little bit different than his. I do care about winning. It just doesn't have to do with certain things, you know? And so anyways, I'm not like, I don't want to, because see, if he did all that, I'm not this letter of the law kind of person. I'm not like, well, the you really should go to jail because you put those people's lives at risk. I'm not like that. What I look at is that, what did you do with the rest of your life? 
to prove that you're not the kind of person that just goes around and does that all the time, risking people's lives constantly. You know what I mean? And I can see this treasure hunt as being a softer version of that. Because the D.B. Cooper thing is a treasure hunt. There's 200 grand out there somewhere. And it's worth way more than 200 grand now. <laughs> Good Lord. You know? Oh, yeah. And if it's actually out there, and if it's actually a mystery to be solved, and that was actually his intention, was to stick it to the government, meaning the establishment who thought they're so good, and show everyone, hey, they're not so good, but maybe you are. Go find it. You know? Maybe that's what he was doing. And for me to say that that's bad, I don't know. Like I said, we shouldn't replicate that, but shoot. And to think about him later in his life being like, well, nobody solved that mystery, and maybe they never will. So let me create something else that in solving this mystery, and it'll be easier for them to solve this mystery than the D.B. Cooper one, they'll actually solve both mysteries. Or, scenario B, he's not D.B. Cooper. He wasn't the person that jumped out of that plane. And he's just trying to, you know, like it's any number of scenarios, right? It is what he says it is. He just wants to, you know, Forrest is mostly what he purports to be which is just a dude that's done with his adventures and he wants to instill a sense of adventure in other people, right? And he's maybe toyed around with the edge of doing some shady stuff, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know. It's, it's all very interesting and uh, I'm ready to, to move on. Now that I've exercised in myself, I understand that I can actually have an adventure with my son and not have to actually fabricate something, I would never have known that had I not actually done that. Now I know I can, I can go on an adventure with him and, and I can really do that and experience it with him. Like trying to solve the DB Cooper case or like maybe trying to hunt for Bigfoot or even better, the best I think trying to find Forrest Finn's treasure, even if we don't find it, the thrill of the chase, because that's what it's all been about. And I, I don't know how much you watched that episode, the D.B. Cooper episode. We, we figured out, we found the money, what we thought was D.B. Cooper's money. It turned us insane. And I'll tell you, man, that video, I planned it to go very differently. And those kids, they're not actors. They went insane over that money they went insane and specifically one of them and he just like he lost it in his head and and i was like patrick like just like with the you're bringing them to battle thing this is real for them and i forget that sometimes you know or i lose track of what that really means and we thought we found db cooper's money and he grabbed that cash and ran. <laughs> he threw it off. And, <laughs> yep. I mean, and, 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 and what I, the video I sent you was the second half because I turned to another one. But like, like I said, I don't have a script for this. But I know the right words exist somewhere. And I'm constantly asking for more time. And I must listen to intuition. I have to listen and I have to change things on the fly. And if I just stick with the plan, I can't do that. And I miss out on the greatest opportunities to, to learn myself and to communicate important things to these kids. And they communicate just as much to me as I do to them, man. Honestly, it's like, and so I, I, we learned that money can just turn you crazy against each other. We figured out it wasn't real. And that was a real, like, shocker. It's like, man, see what this did to us? And it wasn't even real. Man, isn't that a metaphor? You know? It's like, yeah. it's not about... It's a deep or, lesson you were trying to impress on them in that episode. But, but that's what it looks like to you. But it wasn't. I had a different plan. 
and you don't know this, right? Because you couldn't know this. I had a different plan. I was planning on it continuing. I wasn't planning on them figuring out it wasn't real right now. That I wasn't planning on them going insane. That was on the fly. That lesson that you saw communicated was all on the fly. My intention was to continue that, was to make it to where we didn't know it was fake. And we would have to learn way later, episodes later. And there was it was other things. Most of these moral things, they just, when I say moral, I mean having to do with the way and what it looks like to love each other, right? That's what I mean by moral. I don't mean it in the subjective, like, you know. And so the lesson we learned after that, which was, well, maybe D.B. Cooper wanted the money, but once he got it, once he, like, did all that and the rush was over, he was like, man, I feel bad. Like, I risk it. I risk those people's lives. I think I'm just going to... I'm not going to spend this money or I'm going to do something good with it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. And this is, that's another completely imaginary thing, you know, like, (laughs) all right, Patrick is the flight path accurate, man, the FBI's flight path. Yep. I really, I think it's just as likely that it's as accurate as what other people might come up with like Eric, you know, and I tend to, because of the placard, I tend to lean in that direction to where it's more West, you know? Um, and it's funny how we act because it's like, well, it's, it's, it's like, cause we beat that dead horse and it's still dead, you know, I guess with that FBI flight path. And so we find another horse that responds well, I guess we just like, we want to do, we want to act a different way with it. So I, I guess it's like, I feel like maybe it's just because there's no more horse to beat there. And so that's why I want, I lean in that direction because there's actually some horse to beat here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if, if that's why I lean in that direction or if it's because I actually think the evidence is there, you know? But I do find that placard interesting, and I find the explanation of where the money was found and why bury it, because it does look like it was buried, man, you know, like, and and why would, if someone just found the money, would they just bury it? That doesn't make sense, you know? And to think that it washed up on shore on top of each other like that, that's ridiculous. So I feel like it was buried, and it was buried by Cooper. That makes sense to me. Why would he bury it on the Columbia River if he jumped out in Ariel? Unless he floated down the river from Ariel, which doesn't make sense. Like, why would you go that long in the water when it's so cold, you know? Right, and from Ariel, it wouldn't put him near where the money was found. It would yeah. spit him out north well, of that. Well, yeah, so meaning if whether he floated down or he walked from Ariel to the banks of the columbia river right there like it just doesn't and so like that he landed either in the columbia around there or further up um and walked along the shore not too far from bachelor island you know as far as you know walking is concerned whenever you're in that situation um and hid the money um i don't know um, and, and maybe he hid it in different places because, I mean, some of it doesn't add up, you know, uh, cause, but, but, you know, they're smart, he's a smart dude. So thought of something I didn't. So maybe I would have hit it all in one place, you know, just make absolutely sure no one's watching me and then hide it all in one place. Right. But, you know, maybe that doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, so yeah, how the money got to Tina Bar is is baffling. It's the most mysterious thing about the case. Yeah, so a lot, a lot, a lot to go down there. But that's the short answer to it, or the short long answer. <laughs> Was the bomb real? No, I. Do, Why not? I do not think so because I don't think that he would risk his own life if he is a selfish, narcissistic person. I don't think he would risk his own life like that. And if someone's crazy enough to call his bluff, a bomb's not going to do him any good anyways. 
Yeah, I agree with you 100% on okay, that. Okay, yeah. I mean, so it's and, always, and, the question and I always ask took is- it out with him, you know, it's like, first of all, even if he didn't have it, the chance that it might blow up somewhere would tell them exactly, ah, it could be a diversion, but then you'd risk blowing a bunch of people up, you know? And he didn't seem to be that kind of person. So, meaning if you dropped it out of the plane. So I think what they were saying about that beacon makes a lot of sense because- Yes, other people could pick up on that frequency and be like, hey, we saw this frequency or whatever. But the likelihood that somebody's looking for something like that specifically and, and the likelihood that he could choose a certain frequency that would be very unlikely to be picked up on by, you know, anyone who... It's not like we're in wartime and we're looking for any crazy little frequency we hear, you know? Like, they could have calculated that really well. Um, so, yeah, I uh, definitely think it was fake. Did he survive the jump? I think so. <laughs> I think so too. I it's way that. more fun if he survives the oh, jump. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and the money at Tina Bar, the fact that nothing was found except the placard that that we are aware of, right? I guess there could be, you know, but nothing definitively was found other than the money there in that way. <laughs> and uh and that placard like I I think he I think he made it. And uh, I think he even kept his loafers. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, I talked to a guy who's skydived in loafers before. He said right. it's not a problem. You just have to arch your feet so they stay on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think of the fact that there's two different sketches of Cooper? You know, that was the first time that I'd actually heard that definitively. I'd seen sketches that I thought looked different. But who knows what that could mean? recreations different lighting you know i'd never actually heard until i listened to your podcast last night with the two women that there mm -hmm. was definitively two different sketches and so i don't have much to think about that really um to say about what i think about that because i'm not really exactly sure although if it was done by two different artists i can see that being something that's helpful because so do you know if it was done by two different artists I think it was actually done by the same person. Gosh, I'm I'm actually embarrassed. I don't know the answer oh, okay, to that. Right, right. But, um, well, I because I know that they came back a year later and re-interviewed uh, Tina and Florence. Yeah. To come up with another sketch, like maybe mm -hmm. the sketch that they released wasn't good enough, and that's right. why they weren't getting the lead they wanted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, if they if they did it with two different artists. To me, that would make a lot of sense. I mean, I would definitely do that. If we're spending all this money on here. One artist, based on certain people's description, might come up with something different than another artist. And if you had two or three different... Because it's an opinion of an opinion. You know? And when we're talking about matching people up, well, it makes sense to have... You, you know, because like, what is artificial intelligence... It's all of the information that we have given to Google <laughs> and these other companies, and they take the best of our information. It's us collectively, right? And so they overlap it and pick the best. And, you know, and so, like, it's like that at work. If you take people's interpretation of this and you take someone else's interpretation of someone else's interpretation, and then you cross those things together and see where there's similarities, you know, in both visual aspects and verbal aspects. So if someone is taking multiple people's opinions about what the guy looked like verbally and putting that into one picture, then it would make sense to take multiple people's concepts of what those verbal opinions meant and put it into what they understand as the picture of that person. And then maybe we can come a little bit closer to not because if you rule someone out based on the uh drawing but you have another drawing that's like done by a different person that's like oh well we can't rule this person out here because that you know and so it makes it more complicated but it also makes it more um efficient i mean i'm sorry it, it makes it to where you, you can more likely to find it i think you know so mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I like that. <laughs> Why do you think so many people have confessed to this crime? 
Oh man, who doesn't want to be Batman, right? <laughs> uh, you know, and I think a lot of those people probably actually, because they were getting older in age, they probably thought they were. You know, because again, I, I, I cross that. I learned to respect people who are out on the street talking to themselves. I'm like, I respect you because you're still alive, you know, because I got to a point in my life where I told so many lies to myself and other people that I started to not be able to tell what the difference between real and fake was. And when you're in a bad situation, you want to know what the best definition of reality is. And so lying in a way that is manipulative to both yourself and other people is a really good way to get yourself into a bad, bad situation mentally. And so um, I can totally see people telling themselves a story and then forgetting that it wasn't real and the story becomes more real to them than what actually physically happened in their life. And there might be survival reasons for that. And we just talked about why that, well, we don't know that it's not more real. Maybe they're more D.B. Cooper than they are themselves. You know what I mean? Um, I definitely do. Okay, okay. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and yeah, so, uh, and maybe that's what D.B. Cooper was trying to do, part, an aspect of it, which is, hey, you're more me than you think, you know? <laughs> And so a side product of that would certainly be a lot of people forgetting who they are and taking on this identity of this person who they think is quite interesting and incredible. They're like, I should have taken risk like that person in my life. So I'm going to pretend for the last five years of my life that I'm this person, <laughs> you know? Um, so anyways, I could, I, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, okay. So next question. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Last question. Why doesn't this story get the attention it deserves? Mm. Hmm. One answer to that is that it's waiting for the right person to tell it. And I think you and I both discussed that. Um, and the effect of us telling this story to many children or me, you know, but you telling it to adults, you know, you have your podcasts and it's like, you, you explained to me, you're like, the reason I started this, because I didn't see people telling it the way I wanted, the, the way I felt it should be told, or discussing it in the way I thought it should be discussed, maybe, you know? Exactly. And so, so that's one aspect of, the, of an answer to that story, I guess, but I, I, I don't claim to know why it is that some stories did or didn't or should or shouldn't be told you know and i think there you know currently i think most people would agree that the story of of this individual christ yeshua is the most one of the most prevalent and popular stories ever told and continue to be told and who knows what that means for the future right and so uh, and, and I'm saying that objectively without getting in. I, I'm trying to dance around getting into the discussion about what I think about that story and individual for for a um, for many reasons. <laughs> um, <laughs> but one of them is just out of respect for you and our time here. <laughs> um, but I would say personally, that story deeply affects me and the way I live my life. And no matter how far I try to get away from that story, it still pulls me back. And I think that out of respect for this individual, D.B. Cooper, and you, because you spent a lot of time, and myself, because I did too, I spent a lot of time telling the story or aspects of it, you know, I think, I think that stories... If you look at like if you even if it's superheroes, look at Marvel now. You know, look at what Spider Man is compared to what it was at its inception, and go beyond that to a spider itself, spiders as a species. What is that? 
what is that exactly? You know, how that evolves over time, how animals evolve, how peop, um, species evolve, how story evolves by meshing and unmeshing and connecting and taking, taking pieces of other stories. And, and it's like, it's all just happening. And why is it happening? And why isn't D.B. Cooper, you know, one of the most popular stories, although it, it is definitely a pretty popular one. It's a very, very interesting question and a very, uh, I think a very in-depth question. And I think it, it, it's, the answer to it goes deep and beyond um, uh, the story itself, obviously, you know, and, but it touches on something very, like story is so important to us and we don't know what it, like we talked about earlier, we don't know that the stories we tell aren't actually being played out in physical realities beyond here, you know? <laughs> Isn't that interesting, man? So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I man, that's a great question, and uh, it's, um, so part of it is, I think, a simple answer is that the right person and people haven't told it, and maybe, you know, maybe Forrest is somehow, you know, maybe it's like, why isn't it? Well, maybe it's because it hasn't merged with Forrest yet, you know, because you think about it now, if. D.B. Cooper, that's that's a popular story. It's gotten a lot of people to do a lot of dedicated things, like you and I, for instance, but many other people. Forrest, that too. But what if those two stories actually coincide? Like, like actually, and that can be proven. Now, think about the exponential effect of that, right? This could become one of the biggest stories of the century. And all it would take Absolutely. is that, right? Because it's like, <clears throat> it's exponential. You know, and you understand the concept of exponential growth versus just additional growth, right? It's like, oh, yeah. story and that story, if you added them together, it would equal, you know, double. But if you synergize them, <laughs> you know, well, then it's like, there, there's, you know, it's almost no definable limit to how far that story can reach. Um, and, and I actually believe that there are limits to it, but which is why the story of this individual, uh, Yeshua, is particularly interesting to me because it has, it's just not missing much of anything that I can see. <laughs> I haven't found a single thing, a, little, a single thing yet that I'm like, it's missing this. You know, um, and, and when I say that, I mean fundamental things, not, you know, um, anyway, so, um, I think this story has so much potential and whether or not they actually coincide, I think if we tell the stories together next to each other, whether or not Forrest Finn is actually the man who jumped out of that plane, we can synergize these stories I think in an incredible way. And I think in a way that can be good and helpful for people to understand each other and how to love each other better. And well, I look forward to you telling it to us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Hey man, I, I just, you're in, like, a, you're just an incredible listener and you're incredibly patient and you feel like the same person that I started this conversation with only better. And and that's uh, that's that's incredible. So I appreciate you, and I appreciate uh, this conversation a lot. Man, I really appreciate you saying that and coming on the show mm -hmm. to talk to us. If there's uh, somewhere where people can reach out, have yeah. questions, comments, if they totally. want to check out your videos, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, you can email um, me, Patrick at patricksouth.com, south like north, south, east, west. S O U T H. And our channel that we're talking about specifically here is The Adventure Agents. We're on YouTube and on Amazon Prime. And um, we have a website, 
where you can get your official age adventure agent badge with your agent name on it and your picture. <laughs> That's our first product. And, and you can also get your DB Cooper adventure agent shirt. If you're an adult or a kid, I have a shirt or a hoodie that says on the front on the coop case and on the back, it said adventure agents. So <laughs> any of your Cooper people, if they want some Cooper merch, um, I, I, it was so hard for me to start to sell things, <clears throat> but what, now that I've seen people's response and how I want a product that will encourage, encourage and inspire kids to live that adventure. When they have these clothes on, they're, if they're more likely to live that adventure in their own lives on a daily basis, then that was money well spent by their parents, I think. And it's also a shirt. Yeah, and they're looking we need for shirts. It. You know, like so, you know, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, right. who doesn't wear shirts? Birds, right. Yeah. And your adventure agent badge, it's like, you know, like just think about your name. Your name is something your parents just kind of pick before they even know you. And when I say know you, I mean like hear you, talk to you, you know what I mean? And so oh, yeah. think about just like I I my adventure agent name is Agent Tex. Because my middle name is actually Texas. I'm from Texas. And my middle name is literally actually Texas. <laughs> and <laughs> so think about an alternate reality where you can pick your own name. Like now that you're a conscious individual understanding language and communication and that's what a lot of these stars do you know they pick their own names their new name that they think is going to most represent them and or whatever marketing but man i just think it's fantastic for for you to recreate yourself as an adventurer and to act that out together with your family or just with anyone or yourself i just think it's great and so I am also Agent Tex. And hey, who is D.B. Cooper? Who is Forrest Finn? Right? You know? It's like, who am I? Well, I'm Agent Tex and I'm Patrick South. And both of those things mean something and they mean me. I think it's important concept for you to understand that words are just sounds coming out of your mouth. What they mean specifically is determined by you and by other people around you. It breaks down that language like stronghold that language can have on your brain if you let it. So language is important, but we also need, it needs to be moldable. And so, also our name. Um, so anyways, that's what the agent badge is. And, and theadventureagents.com um, is where our website is. You can go and check out everything. So anyways. Um. <laughs> nice. And I'll be sure and put uh, links to everything in the show notes. Okay, awesome. Go check out The Adventure Agents on YouTube or Amazon Prime and at The Adventure Agents on Instagram. Sit down and watch it with your kids or grandkids. It's a fun show, and I really am excited about how many kids are being introduced to one of the greatest mysteries of all time through this show. Go watch it. You'll find links to it in the show notes. Is there a suspect we haven't covered yet, or someone you think we should have on the show? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook. We are The Cooper Vortex. Instagram, at The Cooper Vortex. On Twitter at DB Cooper Podcast, or email us DB Cooper Podcast at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the show, leave us a review. Thank you to Patrick South for coming on the show and for teaching the next generation about DB Cooper. Thank you to Russell Colbert for doing all the work while I get all the glory. I'm Darren Schaefer, and thank you for listening to the Cooper Vortex.